Good morning, everyone. Welcome. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you. A little disoriented after the long weekend. I'm Mark Levine, Chair of the City Council's Health Committee. Pleased to be co-chairing this hearing with Chair Carlina Rivera. And excited that we have so many people who are here today to speak and testify on this important issue. I know many of you, and thank you for fighting for this uh, very important community. As you know, our hearing today is focused on quality and accessibility of health care for individuals who are transgender and gender nonconforming, or TGNC. Last week, on November 20th, we observed Transgender Day of Remembrance, a day when we memorialize and honor the memories of those who have been murdered simply for being who they are. Americans who are transgender and gender nonconforming face extraordinary discrimination, violence, and marginalization. Since the beginning of 2018, at least 22 transgender people have been murdered across the United States. The TGNC community faces unique healthcare needs relating both to physical and mental health, and they are far more likely to experience poor physical and mental health outcomes. When surveyed by the National Center for Transgender Equality, TGNC respondents rated their health as poor or fair at a higher rate than the U.S. general population and reported experiencing serious psychological distress at a rate almost eight times that of the U.S. population as a whole. Individuals who are TGNC face physical and psychological health risks related to societal pressure to, quote, detransition, outdated and fraudulent methodologies like forced conversion therapy, and external physical and sexual violence toward their community. TGNC individuals are also more likely to experience mental health risks, including but not limited to higher rates of suicide attempts and substance abuse. Additionally, TGNC individuals experience HIV and AIDS at far higher rates than the general population. Affordable, accessible, and comprehensive health care is crucial for the survival and health of the TGNC community. While New York State ensures that health insurance purchased through the health care marketplace, Medicaid, Medicare, and many employee-sponsored plans cannot legally discriminate against transgender individuals, TGNC individuals still experience widespread discrimination and misunderstanding from health care providers, and as a result, too often lack safe access to primary and preventative health care. Today's hearing will give the committees an opportunity to hear from the administration and from advocates in the TGNC community on the work they are doing to ensure safe, accessible health care for our fellow TGNC New Yorkers. We look forward to hearing the ways in which we can better support the health needs of this community. I want to acknowledge that we've been joined by committee members Diana Ayala, Antonio Reynoso, Francisco Moya, and I'm now going to pass it off to co-chair Carlina Rivera. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Council Member Carlina Rivera, Chair of the New York City Council Committee on Hospitals, and I want to first start off by thanking my colleague, Council Member Mark Levine, who is the Chair of the Committee on Health, for jointly chairing this hearing with me this afternoon. Since President Trump took office, his administration has worked to limit the rights of Americans who are TGNC, including students, incarcerated individuals, and working folks. As we speak, the Trump administration is considering redefining gender as a biological condition determined by genitalia at birth, a move that would roll back many protections of the TGNC community under federal civil rights law. As the federal administration continues to attack the rights of those who are TGNC, it is critical for the city to support this community. Accessing health care is a critical issue for the TGNC community. According to the 2015 National Transgender Discrimination Survey, which surveyed 27,715 transgender individuals, one third of respondents who saw a health care provider during the year prior to completing the survey 
had at least one negative experience related to being transgender, such as being verbally harassed, physically or sexually assaulted, or refused treatment because of their gender identity. As a result, many TGNC individuals either avoid healthcare services, have difficulty finding providers that adequately understand their social and health concerns, or may avoid discussing gender with their providers. Today, we'll be hearing testimony from the administration and TGNC advocates regarding the discrimination and challenges New Yorkers who are TGNC experience in accessing healthcare services and explore the resources the city offers to help TGNC New Yorkers get the care they need in a welcoming and safe environment. The committees also look forward to examining whether there is any additional assistance the city can provide to better support TGNC New Yorkers. New York City will continue to protect the rights of those who are TGNC and we will continue to validate their experiences and needs even if the federal government refuses to. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Rivera. And now we're going to invite the administration to offer his testimony. Good morning, Deputy Commissioner. Commissioners. Good afternoon. Oh, forgive me. We have to administer a little procedural matter, the affirmation. I'll ask Committee Counsel Zay Emanuel Halu, please. Could you, uh, would you raise your right hands, please? Uh, do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? I do. Good afternoon, Chairpersons Rivera and Levine, and members of the Committee on Hospitals and the Committee on Health. I am Matilde Roman, Chief Diversity and Inclusion Officer at New York City Health and Hospitals. On behalf of Health and Hospitals CEO, Dr. Mitchell Katz, thank you for the opportunity to testify before you at this oversight hearing on transgender and non-conforming friendly health services. Our public health care system is a safety net for the uninsured and underserved in New York City. Our mission at Health and Hospitals is to provide care to everyone, regardless of ability to pay, immigration status, sexual orienta orientation, gender identity, or gender expression. As such, it is a crucial part of our mission to provide affirming services for transgender and non-conforming patients who we recognize continue to experience barriers in access to health care. Health and Hospital serves 1.1 million New Yorkers each year, of which approximately 382,000 are uninsured. A 2015 <coughs> needs assessment published by the New York State LGBTQ Health and Human Services Network noted that transgender and gender nonconforming communities report lack of financial resource as a significant barrier to accessing health services. At Health and Hospitals, we offer a pathway to care for anyone, including TGNC patients. We would otherwise not have access to financial reasons. We have experienced financial counselors who can assist in screening for eligibility and enroll individuals at every opportunity. Health and Hospitals financial counselors will work with TGNC individuals to match them with the insurance plan that best meets their needs. Metro Plus, for example, offers comprehensive coverage for transgender and nonconforming people, including coverage for services such as hormone therapy or gender affirming surgeries. For those who need financial assistance, Health and Hospitals provides a sliding fee scale payment option called Health and Hospitals Options to make care affordable for them. The program offers an affordable fee based upon family size and income that covers all healthcare services, including those specially related to gender affirming care. Since 2015, all of our health system's qualifying facilities have received the designation of leader in LGBTQ healthcare equality by the Human Rights Campaign Foundation's Healthcare Equality Index. This designation demonstrates health and hospitals' strong commitment to LGBTQ health equity through our policies programs, and ongoing training. New York City Health and Hospitals has and will continue to strive to provide patient-centered, affirming care to transgender and non-conforming communities. Despite the uncertainty regarding federal actions that would affect transgender and non-conforming communities' access to health care, Health and Hospitals remains firmly committed to improving the health of all our patients, regardless of their gender identity or expression. We have taken a number of actions over the past several years to make progress on this promise. 
health and hospitals expansion of clinical services, in addressing issues of access to services for TGNC communities, we believe there should be no wrong door in our health system. Transgender and non-conforming individuals should be able to access high quality services at any of our health and hospitals entry points. We also understand, however, that due to a history of discrimination in and outside of healthcare, TGNC patients may feel more comfortable seeking services at a clinic with their identities and expressions as its focus. Our Pride Health Centers offer comprehensive primary care services geared to LGBTQ communities. Services include general preventive care and mental health services, as well as gender affirming care, such as hormone therapy or referrals to specialists. In 2014, New York City Health and Hospitals Metropolitan opened the system's first Pride Health Center in East Harlem. At Metropolitan, we also offer some gender affirming surgeries to transgender and non-conforming patients. Last summer, we expanded the Pride Health Center model with the opening of one at New York City Health and Hospitals Woodhall in North Brooklyn. We have also expanded our offerings of TGNC-friendly services via the Bridge Program at New York City Health and Hospitals Gotham Spring Street, which offers medical, mental health, and other support services to LGBTQ youth and emerging adults. And we continue to explore opportunities to expand services tailored to TGNC communities in the outer boroughs. Collection of sexual orientation and gender identity data. With the expansion of data collection about the gender identities of our patients, we will have the ability to implement programs that more effectively work to reduce health disparities impacting TGNC people. Last month, we optimized our electronic health record to collect comprehensive information about the sexual orientation and gender identity of our patients. Among other exciting new features, this includes the ability to display a patient's current name, regardless of what appears on administrative documents, in the patient header, therefore minimizing the risk of patients being misgendered or misnamed while accessing health services. Health and hospitals investment in educating our employees. Through collaboration with a number of community partners, we continue to expand the educational offerings to staff that build their capacity to provide affirming care to transgender and non-conforming patients. In the past two years, we have launched a partnership with the Boston Children's Hospital to build our pediatric and adolescent providers capacity to care for transgender and non-conforming youth the first ever Certificate of Advanced Training in LGBTQ Healthcare, a comprehensive training program for clinical providers that was co-developed by Health and Hospitals and the Fenway Institute. Clinical trainings for providers on affirming primary care for transgender and non-conforming adult patients in partnership with the Callan Lord Community Health Center. And a workshop specifically for hospital police on preventing discrimination in areas of public accommodation. This program is offered by the NYPD Community Affairs Bureau's LGBTQ Outreach Unit. Patient communication. To make our commitment to providing affirming services to transgender and non-conforming patients clear, Health and Hospitals launched the LGBTQ Services webpage, which outlines our services, non-discrimination policies, and relevant contact numbers. We also created an all-purpose email address to handle any inquiries related to LGBTQ services, which is lgbtq at nychc.org. Support for transgender and nonconforming city employees. Ensuring transgender and nonconforming New Yorkers have equitable access to high quality and affordable health care also means making sure our transgender colleagues across the city have health benefits that meet their specific needs. Last year, Health and Hospitals partnered with the New York City Office of Labor Relations to modify the Citywide Health Benefits Bulletin to more accurately reflect the coverage of gender-affirming care that is available to all city employees. In conclusion, at New York City Health and Hospitals, we believe transgender and non-conforming people deserve equitable and affordable access to high-quality health care. To that end, Health and Hospitals' mission of safeguarding the health of our patients our fellow New Yorkers, and our city remains unchanged. Thank you for your interest and attention, and we are happy to answer any questions you may have after my colleague presents. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Ramon. 
Good afternoon, Chairs Levine and Rivera and members of the committees. Um, I am Dr. Dimitri Daskalakis, the Deputy Commissioner for the Division of Disease Control at the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. On behalf of Acting Commissioner Barbo, I want to thank you for the opportunity to testify today. The mission of the Health Department is to protect and promote the health of all New Yorkers, including the roughly 756,000 people identifying as lesbian, gay, bisexual, queer, transgender, and gender nonconforming. We aim to address and eliminate the health inequities rooted in historical and contemporary systemic injustices and everyday discrimination. Essential to this work are the department services, programming, and health promotion campaigns that seek to improve the health uh, and health care of LGBTQ and transgender and gender non-conforming New Yorkers. Better health begins with personal identification and recognition. Thanks to the council's leadership, specifically Speaker Johnson and the work of the Health Committee in 2014, we paved the way for transgender New Yorkers to be recognized under the law by easing the requirements for obtaining a gender marker change on a New York City birth certificate. All people should have birth certificates that reflect their true gender identity, and these documents can be critical to accessing health care, employment, and other important services. Since 2014, over 1,200 amended birth certificates have been issued to transgender individuals. We hope to see this number increase thanks to the legislative and regulatory changes that will go into effect on January 1st, 2019 to allow an applicant to self-attest their gender identity and the addition of a non-binary gender option. I will turn now to the healthcare services the department oversees. Our clinics offer sexual health, tuberculosis, and immunization services. Many LGBTQ and TGNC individuals frequent our sexual health clinics in particular, all eight of which offer sexually transmitted infection testing and treatment, quick start contraception, and expanded HIV care offerings, including initiation of HIV pre and post exposure prophylaxis, that's PrEP and PEP, PrEP navigation, and jumpstart initiation of HIV treatment. In addition, these clinics offer overdose prevention and syringe availability services and patient navigators and social workers that assist patients in enrolling in social service programs such as substance use treatment and counseling. Our work to improve TGNC health goes beyond our clinic doors and includes innovative programs. In 2017, New York City became the first city to issue an LGBTQ healthcare bill of rights, harnessing existing protections in local, state, and federal laws to empower LGBTQ New Yorkers to exercise their rights in health healthcare settings. This document, available on our website and at health centers across the city, reinforces that providers and their support staff cannot legally provide LGBTQ people with a lower quality of care because of their sexual orientation, gender identity, or gender expression, and tells people where to get help if their rights are violated. Recognizing the important role of community-based support in this work, the department funds four grassroots TGNC-led and focused organizations to, to develop their organizational capacity, including preparing them to compete for funding for social determinants of health programming, such as housing, employment, perioperative support, and social connection. Since the support of family is associated with better health outcomes for TGNC individuals, we also provide funding to Canvas Project Ally, which promotes parental and familial acceptance of LGBTQ youth. The department has also released a series of publications to promote the health of TGNC New Yorkers, including a health bulletin on LGBTQ health with resources for primary care, mental health, and sexual health services, a city health information publication for physicians regarding providing primary care to transgender adults, and booklets developed with members of the TGNC community that include tips and resources to help transgender, non-binary, and gender non-conforming New Yorkers stay healthy. We have also made a concerted effort to develop more inclusive social marketing campaigns by featuring images of TGNC New Yorkers, including people who are well known in New York City's TGNC community. We engage TGNC New Yorkers in the early stages of development of these now world-renowned campaigns, including convening focus groups made up exclusively of TGNC individuals. Recent campaigns, which can be seen surrounding us here, include BHIV Shore, Play Shore, Stay Shore, Bear It All, and Listos. And if you saw more of me around the city last year, that's because I was part of a provocative Bear It All campaign that encouraged LGBTQ New Yorkers to talk openly to their doctors about their sex life, substance use, and other issues affecting their health. 
This campaign aimed to empower LGBTQ New Yorkers to find providers who affirm who they are and incorporate their sexual orientation, gender identity, and gender expression into their health care. This groundbreaking campaign advises New Yorkers who feel they cannot have an open dialogue with their current doctor and receive the care they need to call 311 or visit the website to connect to a provider with experience caring for LGBTQ individuals. The department website con uh, contains approximately 125 healthcare facilities that provide specific services of interest to G TGNC individuals such as pubertal suppression and hormone therapy. Turning inward, the department is committed to ensuring that our programs and services are affirming and inclusive of LGBTQ and TGNC New Yorkers. Building on our Race to Justice initiative, by July 2020, all of our more than 6,000 employees will receive foundational training on implicit bias, discrimination, cultural competency, and structural inequity with respect to gender identity, gender expression, and sexual orientation. Training on gender awareness has already been provided to all staff in our eight sexual health clinics to ensure the clinics are welcoming to LGBTQ patients, with one full day of training being dedicated to providing culturally competent care to TGNC patients. Finally, the backbone of public health is data, but for too long, TGNC individuals have not been adequately represented in this data. This impedes our ability to understand the health needs of this community and develop appropriate interventions. At the health department, we are improving our gender identity collection, both in our surveillance and medical record systems. You will now find data for TGNC individuals in our HIV, STI, and hepatitis surveillance reports. The HIV surveillance publications are unique in presenting certain data by current gender instead of sex at birth and in including data sets specific to transgender individuals. The department is actively working to ensure accurate, consistent, and affirming data collection across all reportable diseases. In addition, at our sexual health clinics, medical records include information regarding gender identity and sex assigned at birth. This not only makes our clinics more affirming to TGNC patients, but improves the accuracy of our records while preventing misgendering of patients during clinical interactions. In New York City, we protect and support TGNC communities, and we strongly oppose any policies that discriminate against anyone based on gender identity and expression. As the Trump administration continues its assault on TGNC people, it is crucial for the city to remain stalwart in its commitment to health equity. The department has submitted uh, uh, comments opposing federal regulations and other policy changes that are an affront to our gender equity and health equity values. Most recently, the department and the New York City Human Rights Commission published an op-ed in Gay City News on the Trump administration's plan to change federal civil, right law, civil rights laws to define sex as based on biological traits identifiable by or before birth. I've included a copy of this op-ed op with my testimony today. If this policy is adopted, the TGNC community will face government-sanctioned discrimination. And as New Yorkers, we must fight back. At the department, we continue to work with the community to improve our services, reduce stigma, increase access to health care, and promote the health of all TGNC New Yorkers. Again, I want to thank Chairs Rivera and Levine for holding this hearing today, and I'm proud to be your partner in this work. Thank you. I think we're ready for questions. Sure. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, a few questions. I wanted to, to go back because in terms of access and, and what you just mentioned in your testimony, uh, there was an article in the New York Times, I believe in 2016, uh, that addressed 25,000 TGNC individuals as saying they didn't feel they had access in their own neighborhoods, especially challenges when it comes to uh, communities of color. Um, in your testimony, you mentioned that there were 125 health facilities that specifically, um, I guess, had information and education related to TGNC health. Is, do you, in terms of what they mentioned as not having access in their own neighborhoods, are these 125 health facilities all throughout the city? Do you feel they're in certain neighborhoods? And, and, and why aren't there more facilities that, that you'll be able to cite? Yeah, so we, we vetted, so I'll, I'll actually explain a little bit more about what we did. So we didn't just sort of find places that had a good reputation. We actually surveyed them and vetted them to actually see if they were truly able to provide the services that we thought were necessary for LGBTQ and uh, gender nonconforming individuals. Um, 
Our health map includes uh, providers throughout the entire city. Um, there definitely are some areas with fewer providers. So for instance, in Staten Island, uh, the north of Staten Island is, the, is where the majority of our providers are that focus on their community. But the rest of them actually are throughout the city. There are pockets. Um, so your Chelsea area, your lower Manhattan does have a lot of providers who um, actually do the service. But we have representation in five boroughs. The other thing about the LGBT community, which is also important, is that not everybody seeks care exactly in their neighborhood. So sort of just get up, up providing people a map and a way to sort of identify folks that are lower risk for them to go to from the perspective of being you know, open about their experience um, is, I think, useful. So I think we're actually working on improving like, and getting more providers on our list, which I think will actually expand the services um, that we have in, in boroughs other than Manhattan. Although, like I said, we have a lot of representation in Queens, uh, Brooklyn, and, and, and the Bronx. Like I said, the, the, probably our most sparse representation is Staten Island. Great. So in terms of H&H &H, uh, hospitals and clinics, do you have physicians who are trained and, and could provide proper supporting care to those who are TGNC? So uh, health and hospitals have made a large investment in training and building capacity for clinical staff to ensure that they're providing affirming services. Um, so we co-developed with the Fenway Institute uh, intensive curriculum on advanced training in LGBTQ healthcare. That includes uh, looking at things from clinical care to transgender youth, clinical care for the LGBT community, behavioral health services, um, looking at uh, sexual orientation and gender identity and the collection of that in information. And so collectively what we've done is we've certified a number of our clinical providers um, and though that though hopefully um, in the coming months we're going to be making uh, that information publicly available so that it will, again, enhance the work that's already been done with the DOHMH in letting individuals know, uh, clinicians who have actually um, underwent this uh, certification program. So you're going to publicly provide information of certified clinical providers throughout the city? Who have done the training at health and hospitals employees who have undertaken this uh, advanced uh, training in LGBTQ healthcare. The, the thought would be is that we're going to be adding that as part of the LGBTQ webpage in health and hospitals and make that publicly available. By the time you, uh, around when do you think this information is going to be ready for the public? So we're working on that now. So right now, currently, we've trained um, and enrolled over a thousand providers within our system to take this training. The hope would be is that once individuals have completed the certification program, that we will then be able to uh, have them um, in this database directory, if you will, and include them in the mapping, hopefully, with DOHMH, so that individuals, you'll have more providers. Um, um, that we know um, can provide affirming services to uh, LGBTQ individuals, in particular TGNC patients. Can you talk a little bit about what certification looks like? How does H&H &H train its staff to provide meaningful care? Yeah, so the training programs, there are a number of training programs that we launched in the last two years. Uh, we've launched uh, a training with Fenway Institute, which um, in carries with it CME credits and allows providers to get a kind of seven hours of intense training on LGBTQ services ranging from behavioral health services, clinical care, how to create an affirming environment um, in engaging with LGBTQ, in particular TGNC patients. Um, that is one program. We've also offered clinical training to adolescent medical providers and pediatricians on caring for um, TGNC youth. Um, and that is with Boston Children's Hospital. And in addition to that, have worked collaboratively with Callan Lord to offer same services for TGNC adults. Um, uh, and so that's been the kind of array of, of looking at how are we building capacity so that people understand how to provide affirming care. Um, and the goal is to really build that capacity across the system. Um, but we also have the Pride Health Centers that are available for individuals who still don't feel comfortable walking um, to any of our facilities that provides the one-stop shop and holistic approach to care. And that has you know the, the gamut of primary care and mental health services that are available in our private health centers as well. This certification, is it an annual thing? Is it one 
and done. So the certification program is is new. It's a pilot, um, and the goal would be is that we are offering that, and and we'll be providing additional training. So this is the beginning of a journey for us as how we are continue on providing ongoing training to uh, clinical staff to ensure that they provide clinical care in an affirming and welcoming manner. And so the goal would be is that once these individuals um, have completed the certification, that we will be introducing more content for them to ensure that they're one, they're, they're up to speed with best practices and how to cr uh, create and provide affirming services to patients. Um, and so this is an ongoing effort on our part. So this is the beginning stages of a, of a longer pursuit for us to ensure that we're providing ongoing care. So this is not a one, this is not gonna be you know, a one-off for us. Um, our commitment is to ensure that we provide capacity building in ways that are meaningful and where we are able to ensure that individuals who walk through our doors are receiving affirming services. And I'll ask about insurance and, and coverage in a second, but I, I hope that, you know, you mentioned pilot program and I kind of, you know, cringe a little bit because I feel like a, a, pi a pilot program is a, is a trial for something that may or may not work. And I feel like this kind of education and ongoing professional development is something that has to be considered mainstream. You know, I, I hope that we don't rely on certification in the future, that when we talk about TGNC Health, it is just as common as OBGYN or as primary care. Um, I, I just ask because I think it's so, so critical for this to be ongoing and, and just everywhere. And, and I wonder how, how many of your patients are members of the TGNC community? Well, we, we are collecting data. We're currently analyzing that data. And, and when we finalize the, the analysis, are happy to share that information. Um, what we, but so just to kind of take a step back and, and kind of reassure the committee about our commitment to the TGNC community, um, when I mentioned the pilot, it was really in reflection of content and ensuring that we were providing um, the best content to our clinical providers, ensure that they're building their capacity in a ways that are meaningful. By no ways is that indicate, um, or should be indicated as um, our steadfast commitment um, to providing care to all of our uh, New Yorkers, including individuals irrespective of gender identity and expression. So when I was referring to it, uh, referring to the pilot, I was referring to content and ensuring that we're evaluating it to ensure that it's having its intended impact and effect um, and that people are retaining the information in a way that's meaningful. And so we are evaluating content in ways that ensure that we are um, meeting the needs of our, our TGNC um, patients. And you know, H and H, um, the council first funded in fiscal year 2017 through the Young Women's Initiative, a transgender specific healthcare training. And then in fiscal 2019, we actually allocated $150,000 to this work under the Unity Project. Is that going to be enough for fiscal year 2020? That's a great question. So I want to thank the city council for uh, the funding that we've received. Much of that funding has actually went toward the training that I am referring to. Um, and part of the objective for us is to build out this training in a way that makes sense, um, to really reinforce uh, best practices and ensure that we are really uh, connecting and, and uh, creating an affirming environment and providing affirming care to our patients. Um, and so, you know, funding is always needed uh, for our municipal healthcare system. And because this is such an important segment of our population, um, we would welcome an opportunity to discuss any future funding opportunities with the city council. So um, in terms of, of data, <clears throat> and, I, and I know that H&H &H is under financial constraints and, and we're working to, to support you with that. In, in terms of data, what is the data like that you are collecting? What's the intake form like? And is that why you can't, I guess, estimate how many TGNC patients you have? Um, in H and H, are you so looking to collect that data now? So, if I may explain the process of how we went live with the integration of. So, and just one uh, to add to that, could you at least confirm that you have TGNC individuals reflected in your staff? In our health and hospitals employees, yeah. yes, we uh, we have forty thousand employees, and uh, we do have TGNC staff in our employment. 
I don't have specific numbers for you, but yes. Um, and we would, yeah, that's without, that goes without saying. I think with respect to the collection of uh, sexual orientation and gender identity data, an important, just to kind of contextualize the process um, and how we were able to do, we really needed to look at workflows and make sure uh, that we uh, understood at where service moments were in the continuum of care, who was asking these questions, making sure that the individuals that were asking the questions were doing so in an affirming manner. Um, and so it took a number of key milestones for us to accomplish this and, and successfully integrate the SOGI data fields within our electronic medical records. So it was, you know, dealing with our stakeholders, whether it's IT and the facility departments to really understand at what point um, at intake and registration um, and at, in, the, in the clinical encounter were the, was the data being asked and collected. And what we've done is to look at how we are creating uh, gender, uh, looking at used names. So not only are we collecting the administrative documents required by law, but we're also asking individuals for their name used. And having that displayed in the header during in the clinical record so that during the continuum of care, individuals are uh, called by their name used. Uh, and also looking at preferred pronouns um, as the kind of the, the two key fields during intake and registration. In the clinical encounter, we have these smart forms that have uh, body parts where in the physicians can have conversations with um, their patients and, and really do proper screening um, based on body parts. And so we have the smart form within the electronic medical records. It's also used by clinicians. Just, just to kind of give you a sense of what we have done so far. Um, do you feel, so you mentioned providing comprehensive services within H&H &H and, and TGNC individuals, they're disproportionately unemployed, HIV positive, and homeless. How is H&H &H trying to address those issues comprehensively? Because based on the data that we've seen, um, TGNC individuals are more likely to go into a hospital than a clinic, and I wonder if it's because of the wraparound services, or do you just feel that insurance-wise that they are just, they have a lot of challenges in terms of denials for gender-affirming care? So uh, every day, health and hospitals enrolls hundreds of individuals into Medicaid, Medicare, our essential plan, and qualified health plans. Um, for individuals who are ineligible for any of uh, healthcare coverage, we have H&H &H options. So to put it simply, you know, no one is denied services based on an inability or, or lack of insurance. Um, we provide care equally to all individuals. Um, so it, it's, it's it, people that are walking in to services through the emergency department, we're providing these services to individuals irrespective of their ability to pay. Did I answer your question? Yeah, I wonder, you know, in terms of, and I guess maybe through the data that you're collecting, and again, I'm, I'm, I'm very interested in knowing exactly what that looks like, why, you know, more TGNC individuals aren't going to some of the clinics, and I know that there are three clinics that H and H is opening on a, like a smaller scale, more like urgent care, um, in, in in three of your larger locations, and I hope that they take all of this into account. My my last question before I turn it over to my colleague is about correctional health services. So uh, this month, actually, we had a hearing along with the Criminal Justice Committee, um, and the Committee on Mental Health, Disability, and Addiction, and the Sylvia Rivera Law Project said the p policy number MED24B at jails is outdated and fails to address uh, TGNC specific uh, care issues long term. In terms of what's happening at some of the jails and correctional health services, do you feel that CHA CHS staff is trained to provide care to TGNC individuals? It's a great question. So many of the correctional health staff have actually been trained in the, the LGBTQ advanced training um, that we offer. Um, and I also know that uh, during um, exa intake exam, uh, gender, uh, gender identity and sexual orientation is 
key questions that are asked for patients um, when they encounter uh, correctional health staff. Um, is there more that we can do? There's always areas where we can improve and uh, we would love to explore those options with the city council and make whatever um, efforts we can um, because TGNC individuals deserve equitable um, quality care at, at every point within our system. Thank you. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. I want to acknowledge we've also been joined by committee members Alika Amprey Samuel, Keith Powers, and Alan Mazel, who was with us earlier. We still hear stories, even in New York City, the most progressive city, or we like to think of ourselves that way. We still hear so stories from TGNC patients about an emergency room visit where they have humiliating questions asked, uh, a, a receptionist at a, at a clinic who insists on misgendering uh, the individual, the patient. Uh, we hear stories of medical providers who uh, say, sorry, we're not equipped to handle uh, TGNC patients. We know those stories are real and they're a source of a lot of pain for New Yorkers. Um, and one of the takeaways from that for me is that this is not not just about the doctor and the physician being culturally sensitive, it's every single person who works in the medical setting, from a nurse's aide to a physician's assistant to the x-ray tech to the receptionist out front. Um, anyone who's coming into contact with any patient needs to be culturally competent, trained, certified. Um, so we have a, a, an adequate experience from end to end. So uh, can, can e any of you talk about our efforts to extend this cultural sensitivity training to non-physician uh, professionals in these settings? Sure, I can, I can start and then I'll segue to. So at Health and Hospitals, um, we agree um, that uh, in order for us to ensure an affirming healthcare environment for everyone, Everyone needs to be trained. And our goal is that there is no wrong, do wrong door um, or for any entry point within our system. Um, so we did train all hospital police and we'll continue to train hospital, hospital police. Um, and I've been partnered with the NYBD uh, LGBTQ unit in order for us to execute that. Uh, we've trained registration staff at intake and registration because they're the front line for the collection of sexual orientation and gender identity data. Um, and we will continue training non-clinical staff as well as clinical staff to ensure that during um, key moments and, and throughout the continuum of care that we are providing affirming services uh, to LGBTQ, in particular TGNC patients. Okay, if, uh, and this might be a question for you, uh, Deputy Commissioner. If a medical provider tells a patient, sorry, we're not equipped to serve you. Has a law been violated? And if so, are we enforcing that law? So that reflects really well onto the work in the LGBTQ Healthcare Bill of Rights where we, we have discerned and translated a lot of the New York City, New York State and federal protections that exist in New York to include the fact that folks need to be able to access um, services where, where they seek them. So um, our strategy along with the New York City Commission on Human Rights is that if someone feels that they've gone into a healthcare setting and they're not offered appropriate care, they can call the commission and they will actually investigate it. So I think that it's, it's um, it, if it doesn't violate a law directly, it violates the spirit of a law. And I think is also something that we recommend folks actually follow up with, with our healthcare bill of rights uh, sort of strategy, which is to make sure that people know about it so we can follow up. And okay. by we, I mean the, the, commi the Commission on Human Rights. Okay, so uh, any New Yorker who is told that um, they cannot be adequately served, essentially a denial of service. We would encourage them to call that number. And, and via 311, you can make that connection. 
via and, through one. And, the, and also, actually, a lot of healthcare facilities around New York have uh, very similar to the New York State Healthcare Bill of Rights, the General Healthcare Bill of Rights. We provide uh, a poster for the LGBTQ Healthcare Bill of Rights, and it's all over everywhere. So if you leave a, a facility and you feel like you're not getting service, that's 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 posted. And so, um, yeah, we would encourage folks to call that number because um, service should be available where they seek it. Mm -hmm. I, this kind of rule is only as good as the enforcement. If it's not enforced, it doesn't help anybody. Has there ever been, to your knowledge, an enforcement action or a Human Rights Commission mm -hmm. case taken up against a medical provider for lack of service? We'll have to follow up with what's um, actually come through the Commission on Human Rights. Uh, my understanding is they've gotten calls and that they have followed up, but I can't tell you how often or if there's been a specific action. Um, I'm not aware of a legal action, but that's also because I'm just not aware of it, not because it may not exist. Okay. Um, both of you talked about efforts to get better data on the TGNC community, and I think we understand the power of that and the necessity of that. Um, in this era of, of hacking and compromised networks, uh, I think we also have to be really worried about the safety and security of this data and the anonymity and the extent to which New Yorkers can feel confident that um, this data will not be compromised. Can you talk about the safeguards for this uh, very sensitive information? Yeah. Um, so we have a, a number of safeguards within our electronic medical records. You know, we're collecting um, personal uh, patient information, and so you know we have um, extensive firewalls and uh, precautions and safeguards in place to ensure that we are protecting that information. And that would also include information related to someone's sexual orientation and gender identity. Okay. Um, uh, there's probably no agency in New York City which doesn't need to be competent in dealing with TGNC, TGNC New Yorkers. Um, it may simply be filling out a form when you're seeking benefits in which there's a question on gender and we need the staff person to be um, sensitive and prepared to handle that. Um, so, um, Ash, I'm going to ask you, since I would presume that your role in the mayor's office is in touch coordinating amongst the many agencies here, not just health, health and H&H, &H, um, do we have a, a, a city government-wide uh, initiative in place to make sure that everyone in any agency dealing with a member of the public is trained and sensitive on how to uh, adequately and culturally appropriately serve TGNC New Yorkers? Yeah, I mean, I would have to get back to you specifically on what individual agencies are doing. I can say for certain CCHR has been very involved in training agencies and agency staff on cultural competency across a range of issues, including LGBTQ uh, cultural competency. But am I right that your role in the mayor's office is in liaising to various agencies? Yes. Is, it, is that right? Yes, I'm the senior LGBTQ policy advisor. But is that more outward focusing to community members or is it also inside of city government? It's both. It's both. Mm -hmm. So uh, does, does each agency then have to develop its own policy uh, around uh, culturally sensitive uh, service to the public? It depends on the agency. Some agencies already have cultural competency training that incorporates LGBTQ competency. Others reach out to CCHR or external partners in order to conduct that training. Um, so it's, it's a little dependent. As we are rightfully holding the private medical sector accountable, we have to make sure that we ourselves are living up to the gold standard. So Absolutely. we just want to continue to push on that front. Um, in addition to sensitivity, we also care about capacity, uh, particularly for gender affirming surgery and, and other really specialized treatments. And there's been progress on that front. Uh, it's not just Mount Sinai, now NYU, uh, Montefiore are offering gender affirming surgery. I believe Bellevue now offers top surgery. But as, 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 as of my latest updates, there could still be months long, even more than a year long wait for uh, a procedure with a specialist. And I'm wondering if you can comment uh, in the H&H &H context or even more broadly about just that capacity question. How long is the wait? What, what I'll say quickly is that the stakes are high because if someone has to wait a year or a year and a half, they might go to an unauthorized provider that um, really could do great harm to, to the individual. 
Um, that's how it was in the bad old days. And we don't want someone to have to be forced to go to the street for either hormone treatment or, or, or surgery. Uh, we want them in a proper medical setting. And, and so, so my question then is about wait times and capacity for those procedures. So uh, as, as I understand, um, we currently have very nominal wait times for at our Pride Health Centers. We have the capacity to provide, and, 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 to, and we're providing primary care screening that also includes hormone therapy in the primary care setting. Um, we've also made uh, extensive efforts to really train clinical providers um, in other facilities, aside from the Pride Health Centers, on providing, you know, transgender affirming care. Um, so our wait times are nominal. In regard to um, specifically to gender affirming surgeries, we provide some surgeries um, at Metropolitan. We started doing so in 2017. Um, and again, uh, our wait times for uh, the gender affirming services are nominal at Metropolitan. So we're meeting capacity and, and meeting the needs of our patient population at this time. Um, one more question, then I'll pass it off to my, mini, to my committee members. Um, there's one segment of the TGNC community that can't take advantage of Medicaid or Medicare or any of the publicly subsidized plans. So the fact that discrimination is outlawed in those plans is irrelevant, and that's undocumented New Yorkers who don't qualify, at least as adults, for any of the publicly subsidized health plans, and the great majority of them live without health insurance. Um, Community Healthcare Network told me that at their facility in Queens, of 350 patients, uh, of 350 uh, transgender and, and gender nonconforming patients, 300 are undocumented. So this is a very significant segment of the community, and many of them have no way to pay for um, any kind of gender reaffirming procedures, and some of them have no recourse other than to turn to survival sex as a way to pay for these bills. Uh, and by the way, we need to be arresting the Johns, not the sex workers, that's another hearing. But um, what do we do to meet the medical needs of transgender um, and, and GNC New Yorkers who are undocumented and therefore can't access any of the public plans? So at Health and Hospitals, we do a preliminary screening for the, to seek uh, qualifying health care coverage. For those individuals who are ineligible, um, case in point individuals who are undocumented, we do have H&H options, which is our sliding fee scale payment options that allow individuals for no to low cost to receive care. That includes gender affirming care and services to the TGNC population. And so we are providing services. Our mission is to provide care regardless of someone's ability to pay, insurance, gender identity, or gender expression. Um, that's true today, it'll be true tomorrow, and it'll be true in 10 years from now. Well, thank goodness for the sliding scale at health and hospitals. Um, of course, that doesn't apply in the voluntary hospitals and other settings. And um, generally, people don't go to a hospital until they uh, are in crisis. And getting every New Yorker a chance to have primary care in a culturally sensitive, often community-based facility is really the ultimate goal. And um, and we've talked about, particularly with my colleague Carlos Menchaca, about creating some sort of health plan mm -hmm. for people who are not insurable on the public plans, which is the undocumented, to get them into a clinic for their vaccinations, their annual physical, so that it doesn't escalate for the need of a hospital visit. We uh, welcome them at Health and Hospitals. I, I know that, and we thank you for that. And I'm going to pass it off to our colleague, Councilmember Reynoso, who had a question. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, Thank you for being here. I just want to ask a question again. I didn't get the an I didn't hear the answer. Uh, it was asked by Councilmember Rivera. It was um, related to employment of the TGNC community and um, whether or not we were taking that on as a city. Um, and you just kind of said, "Yeah, we're doing that." Um, I just need a little more detail. Do we know how many employees um, of the community are in the hospitals in our hospital network? So um, I don't have firm numbers for you now. Um, we have 40,000 employees across our system. 
um, and um, have are now working toward integrating in our, P in, in our HR PeopleSoft system a way of people to self-identify. It's critically important for us to ensure that we're not only providing affirming services, but also creating an affirming environment for our work colleagues. To that end, um, the goal would be is to uh, find an opportunity where we're allowing individuals to self-report um, their, their, their gender identity, and that's something that um, we're working on now. I, I would just like to maybe for the future mm -hmm. that we get numbers, I guess, or data or information. I can only imagine being in New York City and never seeing, let's say, a Latino face right. in Health and Hospitals Network, and then feeling like there's a culturally a cultural dis a disconnect happening, um, and um, having someone that looks like you has gone through the same experiences in the room um, really helps uh, with someone feeling comfortable um, and being able to get services, especially here in New York City. So I really want to be more more direct with that, and making sure that you get that we get something that's more affirming than just we, we're working on it or we're trying to be more uh, smarter about how we classify folks and, and so forth. I, I think that's important. Um, I, I want to talk about your relationship with uh, organizations that work with uh, TGNC members. Uh, what is the relationship between health and hospitals and these like local organizations that have been doing this work on the ground for a long time? So Health and Hospitals commitment is strong, so strong that um, about a year and a half ago, we brought on uh, the first Associate Director for Gender Equity, um, Sarah Bender, who could not be here today because she's in Better Pastures um, traveling. Um, mm -hmm. But really, it's really an attempt for her to be uh, doing a lot of the community outreach and, and just recently um, had a walk through at and many of the Pride Health Centers and met and at Woodhall with the uh, Sylvia Rivera Law Project. We work with Lambda Legal uh, and we work with a number of other uh, organizations. Um, one, it's important for us to get feedback, learn what we're doing well and where there are opportunities for us to improve our services and our engagement. Um, we are actively involved with community um, and, the inter and just having interagency collaboration um, with City Hall um, just to ensure that we are meeting the needs of our patients and providing affirming services. And so, and we will continue doing that. So we've issued our webpage um, for LGBTQ services. We have um, doing a, a number of outreach. We've issued a number of uh, videos that serve both as reinforcement of our practices, our best our be, our policies and practices for patients, um, and also are working closely with community organizations to ensure that we um, are understanding the need and working to address it. I will I would like to see if we can have time where I can see that type of work happening locally, um, specifically with Woodhull Hospital, um, which I always try to take an opportunity uh, to bring in as many resources into this hospital and make sure that we're a premier hospital in the city of New York when it comes to like how we want to move forward. Um, I want to see how we can work with local organizations and just see how the staff there is interacting to see if it's appropriate and see if we're doing the right thing. Um, I know we have a LGBTQ clinic in, in Woodhull, one of the first, and we're very proud of it, but we just want to make sure that um, we're, we're moving along and we're not just satisfied because we were one of the first, so we started it, but that we keep growing. Um, I do want to ask, related to um, anything that's happening in the federal level, especially with Medicaid and Medicare, um, how, it's gonna, how we're prepared to protect ourselves against um, anything that might threaten health care for the uh, TGNC population. I just want to know if we are prepared for that, um, and if, if legally we're not, if legally, let's say, Medicaid and Medicare can't work, what options do we have to make sure that we're continuing to provide services for folks that need it? Sure, so I can just uh, sort of reemphasize that in New York City, we have some of the strongest legal protections for trans and gender non-binary people in the country. Um, and those protections include protections in hospitals, health centers, and also insurance. Um, so the, the response of the Trump administration potentially to roll back Obama-era protections for trans and non-binary people in healthcare, um, there may 
maybe some implications, but we, as far as local protections and state protections go, we're in a pretty good place. Um, of course, that doesn't mean that stigma won't increase against trans and non-binary people with um, federal rhetoric as it is, but we do have very strong protections here in New York. So just educate me. Uh, Medicaid and Medicare are federal programs. Uh, if federally mm -hmm. uh, the president says that you're either M or F or you're not receiving services, Mm -hmm. We can we we don't control Medicaid and Medicare. I'm assuming that. So I just want you to help me through that interaction. Should that happen, mm -hmm. um, where I'm, I have to identify as M and F, M or F, to be able to get services, mm -hmm. I can't do that. So what happens? How does the city come in and protect us and protect the the TGNC community? Yeah. So I I can say. Um, and I'm happy to follow up with like a little more detail on Medicare in particular, which I know less about, but in the Medicaid context at least, we do have state protections around discrimination that are um, aimed at protecting trans and non-binary people, particularly in, sh in insurance coverage. Um, and so should the federal government do what it is saying it will do around redefining protections on, in terms of federal non-discrimination, we still have these state and local protections in place. Um, and Medicare and Medicaid are sort of dictated by separate agencies than the ones that we've been hearing might change their rules. So there could be changes that we haven't anticipated yet or even heard about. I just want to prepare, I guess, and just yeah, absolutely. Get, get to a place where I feel comfortable because I'm very, I'm, I don't know what it is, a gray area there that we're talking about when it comes to healthcare, especially Medicaid when we're talking about um, large uh, population of unemployment, homelessness. So we're talking about people that are probably gonna need Medicaid so I really want to get there and understand that. And then if we, if we can't do something or if we're, it's threatening, are we going to sue? And if we're not going to sue, how are we going to compensate and make sure that there is health care um, for all New Yorkers? But I really thank you for your time here. And thank you to our chairs for uh, another great hearing. Thank you. Thank you, Member Councilmember Reynoso. I believe Councilmember Ayala has a question. And sorry, we've been joined by Councilmember Dr. Mac Matthew Eugene, as well as Councilmember Inez Merritt. Thank you. <clears throat> so my question is regarding the, uh, the health centers. There are two health centers citywide, is that correct? So we currently have um, two Pride Health centers, one in Metropolitan and one in Wood Hall, and we're looking to also expand services to other areas in the outer boroughs. And how often are the health centers available? How, how often are they open? So the programs, um, I don't have the specific schedule in front of me, um, but they're often, they're offered, uh, programs are offered, clinical programs are offered several times a week, um, and individuals can make an appointment either through our call centers or directly with the clinical program. And so, um, and it's been, uh, in 2014, um, the first Pride Health Center was open in Metropolitan, and we just recently um, opened one in North Brooklyn, uh, Woodhall Hospital. Um, and the goal would be is that as um, there's an increase in demand and opportunities for us to provide these services in other locations, um, we're exploring that at this, at this point. So is the number of days that a clinic is open determined based on the number of people that are frequenting that clinic? Yes. So in East Harlem, Metropolitan Hospital is my district. Mm -hmm. We opened in 2014. I'm very excited about that, and I, you know, I brag about it. But my understanding is that it was only open on Saturdays. Is that still the case? Because it's been four years. I believe that they're, they've expanded services for two, two times a week, I believe. I don't know if it's Wednesday or Saturday, but I'm not quite sure. Um, but it really is contingent on volume and demand. Um, and, as in, and as we increase the panel um, for patients, um, we then in, increase services. Um, so if a, if a patient that identifies as TGNC is seeing a primary doctor at one of the hospitals that is participating, is that primary care doctor then referring them to the clinic as an option? It could be an option, or the primary care physician can meet the needs of the patient. So it really is a case by case, on a case by case basis. If it's screening and preventative care, and our physicians have been trained and, are, and are, have the capacity to provide affirming care, 
that individual can seek services at any one of our facilities. Um, the Pride Health Center really is intended to be a one-stop shop um, for individuals who may not be comfortable just walking into any one of our facilities, but want to be uh, feel like they're in an environment where their gender, gender identity and expression is the focus of care for them. Um, but services can be provided in any one of our locations. And what is the difference between a health center and the, uh, the bridge program? So the bridge program is, um, it's in Spring Street, and it's uh, related and geared toward uh, youth with an expertise in LGBTQ youth services. Um, and so it provides primary care screening for uh, young adults, uh, emerging adults, and adolescent youth with a specialty in LGBTQ youth services. Okay, and I think that it was, um, I think maybe the Department of Health mentioned that the Bronx doesn't happen to have a health center because it's rich in resources. What are those resources? Where do they exist? Um, we have a lot of providers in the Bronx, um, non-H&H non &H and also H&H &H that provide services um, that have made our health map and our list. So including Montefiore, the adolescent program there. We have, again, um, all of the hospitals um, and, and the clinics at H&H. &H. Like, I think you said that they're HRC certified. And so I think there we, we refer folks to there all the time. So really, Bronx actually is interesting because in general it has a lot of service providers and a lot of community-based organizations that work really well together. That's evidenced by the fact, um, one of our greatest examples, which does touch the TGNC community, is our, our work in uh, the um, um, New York Nose program. Bronx Nose was the first uh, program to sort of launch a, a, a local effort to increase HIV testing. It's just an example. They're the most successful in the city, where they've actually reached 96% of people with HIV aware of their of their status. So, though a big area, um, we have a lot of providers that do do provide service, and also a lot of community-based organizations, including some of the grassroots ones that we fund that are located in the Bronx. I mean, they're great at connecting people to services, but I wonder if the services that they're connecting people to are necessarily the services they, that they're looking for. Because I agree that we, I, I love the Bronx Nose. Like, I mean, I was at their 10th year uh, anniversary celebration recently, but are they connecting people to the Bronx? Like, how many, how many of our hospitals are equipped with providers in the Bronx that are trained to deal with this population? Right? We can, we can get back to you from the health map to tell you how many facilities and how many providers we have that are in the Bronx. I don't know off the top of my head, but in general, that's an area that's not particularly underserved from our perspective in terms of density of provider who have awareness and, and facility at, at providing LGBTQ health. I think that in general, though, I think that, that from the transgender, gender nonconforming perspective, you know, I think you have to be very specific about the services that people need. And one of the efforts that we made in our health map is to not just say trans health or gender nonconforming health, but you, know, you want to find someone who does pubertal suppression, you can search that. You want to find someone who can do certification letters, we, we've got that. People who do hormone therapy. So we want to make it easier for people to really find what they need rather than just like clump everything together in one big story, which I think is also what H&H &H is doing. Understood, thank you. Thank you. All right, thank you very much to the administration. Oops, forgive me, Sorry. Chair Rivera. Just have a, I just have a few more. Um, the first one is it's back to the to, to data. So, Rain, uh, Councilmember Reynoso mentioned a little bit about the data that you're collecting, and I know that you said you're in the process of it, and you're not sure when it'll be released to the public. And I've asked you a little bit about what it looks like, but um, I I don't I don't really I don't think I got an answer. But can you at least say that based on the data that you've collected that you can in many ways kind of assess and determine what are the experiences and some of the health outcomes in the TGNC NB community? So the goal would be that the data that we collect will serve for us to really understand the health disparities, and more, in, more detailed health disparities that are happening um, with, with the TGNC community. Um, and so asking you know, for gender identity is the first step in the process of really then being able to stratify the data against a number of health outcomes and other issues impacting 
um, the TGNC community that will help us and allow us to then craft preventive and intervention strategies to really um, eliminate the barriers and improve the health outcomes for TGNC patients. And so that would be the goal. So gender identity, looking at it not just from sex assigned at birth, but the expansive spectrum of gender identity is what we've done in the collection of our data fields. And, and through this data, are there program opportunities identified that are going unfunded that could benefit the TGNC and B community? Because we, we want to partner with you, and, and we, want, we realize that funding is always an issue. So if there are opportunities or, or programs that are going unfunded that there's an incredible potential and opportunity, and, and there are people in this room that can surely help identify, and I do have a question about um, TGNCNB liaisons for the TGNCNB community. Are you speaking with them? Are you working with them to develop programs that we could potentially fund as a council? So we always are uh, excited and willing to partner with the city council and members of the community to find strategies and solutions to help support the TGNC uh, New Yorkers. Um, that goes without saying. Um, and we are aware of the advocates' request for funding for the liaisons um, and happy to have those conversations and explore that further. What we've also are doing is to really build capacity for our current patient navigators, because again, as to Mr. Levine's point, um, in having you know, you know, clinical affirming training is one thing, but before you get to the provider, you need to ensure that affirm, affirming and welcoming environment is happening from the point of entry to the point that you see the physician. And so part of our strategy um, in the no wrong door approach is to build capacity to non-clinical staff. Um, and that would include patient navigators, community health workers, um, so that they um, can provide affirming services um, throughout um, health and hospitals. And I, I wholeheartedly support the advocate's request for this sort of consideration. I think it's really important. And I say that because we could talk about diversity until we're blue in the face, but it is all about representation. And for someone to see themselves rep represented in staff or in the hospital systems is incredibly important. So I wanted to ask, um, what specific initiatives has your office implemented to ensure a diverse workforce? So we're exploring talent acquisition opportunities where we're reaching out um, uh, and sourcing um, to identify individuals who can apply for positions at health and hospitals. That we do, um, and we will continue to do so. Um, and it's really us understanding where there are opportunities for us to leverage. I, I, I agree with you that you know representation is important. Um, and the hope would be is that as we're ensuring that our staff is reflective of the communities in which we serve, uh, that we are making a concerted effort, my office is making a concerted effort uh, to ensure that we're you know, casting a wide net um, and ensuring that we are sourcing in, um, in, in creating opportunities for individuals to seek employment at health and hospitals. My last question is about costs. We had a hearing, uh, Chair Levine and I, just earlier this month on the disparities in costs among the entire healthcare system, specifically among hospitals. And I know that many employer-sponsored insurance plans cover TGNC services, but still there are a lot of out-of-pocket costs uh, for, this particular, for these particular New Yorkers. What types of programs are available to help cover these costs? So for individuals who are uh, not eligible for whether that be Medicaid, Medicare, essential plan, or, or qualifying um, health plan, we have H and H options that cover the costs. And uh, you know, the goal would be is that we're providing care to everyone irrespective of their ability to pay, and irrespective of insurance. Um, and um, as a fallback, we have H and H options that, for nominal fees, people can seek gender affirming care at any one of our health and hospital facilities. And I ask because the price of gender-affirming care and surgery is very different between a private surgeon and a public surgeon. And I wonder whether you can explain why is it so different, for example, for breast augmentation? 
I'm unable to answer that question as I, um, I don't know the difference. Um, but we do offer it at Metropolitan. Um, so we are offering top surgery at Metropolitan Hospital since 2017. Um, and the panel has grown um, at Metropolitan, but I don't know the difference. It's, you know, our, our hearing was, um, I guess, enlightening in the way that if people were, you know, it was, the blame was put on the insurance companies and the insurance company blamed the, the hospital itself. And so it actually left a, a lot of mystery to an already very complicated process, unfortunately, which is just a disservice to New Yorkers. Um, and I, in, in the end, I just want to ensure that um, when we talked about the training, because I think that's important, and I know that I'm, I'm going away from the, the cost question, but that when Council Member and Chair Levine mentioned non-medical um, professionals, whether it comes to administrative services or even the NYPD that are present in your hospital systems, it's really, really important that it is TGNC NB individuals, you know, conducting those trainings, and I will always support that. So I know that you all are working hard and we, and we appreciate all that you do and um, we hope to be partners in the future to support all of these initiatives. And again, if there are programs unidentified that we can work together with the advocates in this room to fund, I, I would be happy to support that 100% and champion that cause. And with that, I'm, I'm all done with questions. Thank you. All right, thank you very much and thank you to the administration for speaking. And we're gonna call up our next panel, which is Barbara Warren from Mount Sinai. I think it's Nathan Levy from the New York NYU Langone. Forgive me if I'm mispronouncing. And Kimberly Smith from Callan Lord. Barbara, do you want to start us off? Is this on now? It is, okay. Um, hello everyone, good afternoon um, uh, to everyone um, on both committees and the, the uh, Chairperson Rivera and Chairperson Levine. Um, my name is Barbara Warren, I am the director for Lesbian, Gay, Bisexual, and Transgender Programs and Policies in the Office for Diversity and Inclusion in the Mount Sinai Health System. I also um, hold a faculty position as an assistant professor of medical education um, at Mount Sinai's Icon School of Medicine. And I am here this afternoon to talk a little bit about what we've been doing in the Mount Sinai Health System and also in the School of Medicine around increasing capacity to deliver uh, culturally competent and clinically competent care across the spectrum of care to uh, TG, I say TGNB, transgender and non-binary um, uh, patients and prospective patients, healthcare consumers. Um, I'm not gonna read my testimony verbatim because um, I, I, there's a lot of background in there about Mount Sinai and who we are and what we do. Um, uh, and I think s most of you are acquainted with us. Um, I do want to talk about a couple of initiatives, though, today that I think are really important and, and actually address some of the questions and concerns that um, have already uh, come out uh, in the testimony today and in your questions to the, the folks that testified on the panel. Um, and uh, there's a couple of things. You know, we st um, I have actually been in the system now for seven years as the designated um, LGBT point person for the system. I was hired back in 2012 by Beth Israel, then Beth Israel Medical Center, uh, which was part of then Continuum Health Services, which was, is now part of the Mount Sinai Health System. I was actually the first full-time, fully designated LGBT point person um, anywhere actually in the country that was holding this position full-time in a large healthcare system to oversee and help facilitate system transformation 
around LGBT inclusive care. Um, so actually, um, with that appointment and then um, up through now with Mount Sinai, uh, being merged with Continuum. I, I've been doing this for about seven years. And the caveat I just want to say is we are a work in progress. I, I'm not here to say, oh, solved it, done, everything's perfect, Mount Sinai is perfect. Um, there's lots of challenges uh, in a very large urban health care system with over 45,000 employees across uh, eight, now eight, uh, hospital sites um, and a large um, medical school and the, one of the largest ambulatory care systems um, in the state, as well as the largest um, graduate medical education training program in the country. We have 2,600 residents uh, who are a house staff across all of our facilities and in all of our sites. So given that, um, it's a lot of work to do to make sure that everybody is equipped with the skills and the resources um, to serve all of our patients, uh, including our LGBT patients, uh, competently and affirmatively. And that is a work in progress. And we do a lot of training and education, um, and we've got a lot more to do. Uh, and that includes frontline staff, security guards, uh, healthcare providers, et cetera. So that's something that I've been sort of overseeing and facilitating now for the last seven years. And I would say that probably to date we've trained close to 15,000 folks, but we have 45,000 employees and we're tr always trying to find better ways to impart the information. The ideal would be um, certainly for everybody to have ongoing, in-person, perfect training. Um, but the real is that we are trying to use many, many methods to get information across to ensure that people are in compliance with legal and regulatory um, uh, 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 in compliance issues, both at the state and city level, um, as well as nationally, um, so, and the clinical issues as well. So all of that being said, there's a couple, Am I over? <laughs> Gee. Well, there's a couple things I, yeah. <laughs> wow, that wasn't very long. Um, there's a couple of things I want to highlight that we've been doing. And there's one thing in particular I really want to highlight, given what you, you were talking about earlier. And that is the need for um, a, a more highly qualified workforce across the system, um, particularly in the clinical area, but across the whole system. Mount Sinai, for the last couple of years, um, we have been investing in education and training, not, re as re not just retroactively, but proactively. We have, uh, we have a medical school, a nursing school, uh, administration, in, uh, a medical administration program, healthcare leadership program, and a really large fellowship program and biomedical training institute. We have worked on integrating uh, content around LGB and transgender and non-binary um, uh, clinical um, and educational material throughout our four-year medical school curriculum in our residency training program, um, in our master's in public health program, in our nursing curriculum. And this is something that um, I, I'm really proud of. We've done a really great job, uh, but we're still working on it. We want to train people before they get to the point of care so that we don't have to keep going back and retro retroactively educate everyone. Um, so that's something I think that's really important. Uh, to that end, we also do a lot of um, training and education that we make available to uh, our colleagues around the city, including um, we started the first ever live surgery conference. You know, I hear that you want to increase capacity uh, and have more people uh, be available to train people, but um, also, I don't think it's fair to expect folks of transgender identity experience to go see people uh, because, they're, because the providers are mandated to provide services that they're not competent to provide. I really worry about that. I, I, I know that there's some regulatory compliance that, that's there to get people educated, but I also am worried about um, uh, saying, oh, you're mandated, you have to treat this person, you can't turn them away if you're not qualified to treat that person. I know I wouldn't want to go to somebody that wasn't trained and qualified to treat me just because they were mandated by law that they had to provide services. So to that end, we've been working um, really to, to do education and training that's meaningful and that really uh, enables people to provide the best and highest quality health care. And that's actually from the get-go, from the beginning of their education and training. 
The other thing I want to highlight that we've been doing, and, and we could use some more support around that, we really could use, we're having another live surgery conference um, at the end of February, beginning of March. We'd love to make it available to more people. The surgeons pay for it, pay for it to go, but we'd like to be able to scholarship more people. We want to start an integrated youth gender center. And then one last thing I've got to tell you about, because um, it's been my um, dream come true, but we need funding and support around it. And that is our, we have a lot of pipeline programs. And this year we were able to get a small amount of funding um, to create designated internships for folks of transgender and identity and experience at the high school level and college level in our pipeline programs. They're medical, nursing, education, healthcare administration training programs. And um, there's training, there's education, there's paid internships. Um, and um, we started a pilot last summer. We got funding to actually have designated internships. We really need to make healthcare, education and training available to, to more folks of transgender identity and experience to meet some of the things that you were talking about, such as having, being able to go see a provider who represents who you are in your community. So, Th Thank you, Dr. Warren, for your remarks and, and for being way, way, way ahead of, of society in general and, and, and leading in this space. And, and, and you've helped make uh, Mount Sinai one of the leaders globally. Um, sorry for the rushing on the time. No, we, have just, we, have, we have a long list of people who want to speak, and so we just want to yeah, give everyone okay. a chance to. We have uh, it in writing, so. We do indeed. Thank you. Please. Hi, everyone. I'm Nathan Levitt. I'm, the, uh, I'm at NYU Langone Health. I'm a nurse practitioner coordinator in our transgender surgery program. So a lot of what I have here, I just want to thank everyone on the council for inviting us to speak. This is a wonderful opportunity. Um, a lot of the information I have here is about the barriers for transgender people in healthcare, which we've gone over a lot today, I know. So I'll sort of skip through that. Uh, but I would say as a transgender person myself in this role working with trans patients is a really amazing opportunity. And I really appreciated your push for hiring and representing tra the transgender community because it's so important that there's that we're involved in this and that we're seen as people that can give feedback that are connected to the community. So that's really important. I think my role in working with transgender patients going through a life-changing experience of surgery is so incredibly important for them to see someone that represents them, for them to see someone that understands the barriers that they face is so important. So I really appreciate your focus on that. Um, and I train healthcare providers throughout the city and the country on specifically on transgender healthcare, whether it be through surgery, uh, healthcare providers, from the front desk to the provider level. And I, I know how important this training is and how it, it really doesn't, it needs to be more in the health professional schools, which I know is what Sinai is doing, Cal and Laura does, and also NYU Langone does as well. And so what we do at, at NYU Langone, we've recruited uh, one of our surgeons, Dr. Bhuvan Langner, who works with our patients providing all sorts of gender affirming surgeries. Our RN, um, who's here with us today, Kevin Moore, who represents the LGBTQ population and helps really access services for people, to help them in a system that's obviously, you know, often traumatic for people, discriminatory for people. So he helps create that access for people. And we are training throughout our healthcare system. So within NYU Langone Health, within the nursing school, within the medical school, to make sure that every part that are, uh, we call them touch points, every point that a transgender person could reach within the health, within the health system, within our health provider system, is trans sensitive. And that requires so much work, right? And making sure that we also have a trans patient and family advisory board, which helps us to know what are the issues in the community? Are we doing the best job that we can do? How are patients and family members and their caregivers involved as well? In addition to that, we also started uh, surgery classes, which help our patients understand what is coming up ahead. What are some of the mental health issues that might come up before or after surgery? How do we connect people with community? How do we make sure that people are getting the best surgical outcomes, but also the best mental health outcomes they can in a system that can be very, very difficult for a lot of people. We're also working on our electronic medical record to make sure that people are called the name that they have chosen, the pronouns that they go by, but that it's beyond pronouns and names. It's also what language do they use for their body parts? How do we make sure that every part of this is affirming for people? How do we make sure that we move away from what's very gendered, women's health or men's health, and really just what do you have on your body? How do you take care of it? Which is what we're really working on. Um, we work on bed policy to make sure our trans patients are in the, the room that they, the gender that they identify in. So we have a new hospital that has single rooms, so that makes it a lot easier for our patients. And we just basically say nothing for transgender people without transgender people, and that's incredibly important to us. So I just wanna thank you for the opportunity to speak today.
Thank you. So, so uh, important to have your perspective, and thank you for your work, Nathan. Kim? Hi, good afternoon. Thank you so much uh, for the opportunity to testify before you today. My name is Kimberly Smith. I am representing Callan Lord Community Health Center. Um, uh, you probably know that Callan Lord Community Health Center's mission is to reach lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender communities, as well as people living with HIV, with sensitive, high quality, and comprehensive health care, regardless of ability to pay. With three locations, last year we served approximately 18,000 patients, more than 4,000 of whom identify as transgender or gender non-binary. I'm gonna also not read verbatim and try to cut to the chase, so to speak. Uh, so we are observing here in New York um, that the increased access to public and commercial uh, insurance coverage for gender-affirming care and surgeries uh, is doing for transgender in individuals what PrEP, pre-exposure prophylaxis, did for HIV-negative gay men, and that is to provide a gateway to primary care. And this gateway is a great opportunity, but it also is revealing many uh, complex challenges that, that our TGMB patients face in accessing and navigating healthcare and achieving health equity. For example, our patients routinely report discrimination in all forms of healthcare, including emergency room, uh, and specialist visits. Some have substance use issues and there are not LGBT specific substance use treatment centers are not enough for us to refer them to. They face homelessness and have no LGBT specific adult shelters for us to refer them to. There are limited providers in New York State, including surgeons that are educated on TGMB care. And even well-meaning physicians do not get the training they need to adequately serve TGMB patients. So while the insurance uh, coverage is a huge step forward, TGMB people accessing health services that they need. We need a larger network of TGMB competent providers of both health and social services to come together to address these challenges. So at CalNOR, we actually internally have uh, formed a working group to look at these challenges. And I, while it is just launched, I want to offer a few initial recommendations as potentially applicable for the city to consider. One is to create uh, and fund a model, integrated citywide network of services that would specifically support and address TGMB health access. This network would include a coalition of agencies that share a common vision toward helping TGMB patients meet their goals and improve their health outcomes. And there's more specificity in my written testimony on that. Two, secondly, is to, that we need to continue to track and aggressively fight against health care discrimination, specifically insurance denials for gender-affirming care and surgeries. And even with the state-level legal and executive rulings removing restrictions on medically necessary health care for transgender uh, Medicaid and commercial plan recipients, we're finding that folks are still being denied. Uh, approximately 16% of our patients who have, uh, are seeking surgeries or gender-affirming care have been denied um, access because of the insurance um, coverage. And while we are seeing some promising steps in this area, this is something that we urge the City Council to support uh, to continue to enforce these regulations and help monitor and track and address these issues locally. Finally, we would urge the New York City Council to increase its investment in transgender equity and LGBTQ specific funding initiatives that promote transgender health uh, and economic security. Um, it's uh, sustaining funding will be critical to supporting TGMB leaders, organizations, and a range of services that ultimately can address health access and the drivers of health and equity. So thank you so much for allowing me this opportunity. Um, do, do you, uh, do, do any of you, maybe I'll, I'll ask you, Barbara, have thoughts on what the broader system needs to do to ensure qualified staff? Your own operations are running <laughs> according to very high standards, but in the broader world, what, what can we as policymakers well, do? Well, I, I can tell you we don't have enough qualified staff um, even though we have very high standards. Um, I think supporting, and, and you know, it's interesting because like the three of us, for example, we've been working together across our systems for a number of years. We do a lot of um, training in, in education um, uh, across our systems. Um, but I think um, two things. I think finding a way to support um, uh, folks uh, coming into training programs that are in the city um, including the, like some of our, our medical, tra our, our, I'm sorry, our school programs, giving people access to scholarships uh, to attend some of the training that exists. Um, I, I also, you kept using the word certification, and I have to say they're really, certifications 
to me, a legal term that, that establishes like what somebody's qualifications and credentials and training is to meet certain needs. There really isn't a certification in transgender medicine. The World Professional Association for Transgender Health has just started one, but it's not a legally recognized certification. So I just, I don't want to misuse that word too, too much. And I think maybe even looking into it, maybe the task force that, that Kimberly is talking about could look into, can we establish some kind of a, a standard and a certification across some different disciplines around transgender medicine, and then support that by scholarshiping people into those training programs. Yeah, I, I would agree. I'd also say the work that that we all do also in health professional schools, so I will talk to people about how this isn't transgender medicine separate from everything else, right? So like if we think about our patients at NYU Langone, they might have surgical issues. They might also need to come in for a pap smear. They might need to come in for a prostate screening. So all of the things that are connected. So making sure that trans health is a part of each discipline is incredibly important. I think that can help in talking, funding more um, trainers to come into health professional schools so that when people come out of school, social workers, um, nurse practitioners, nurses, RNs are more adequately equipped to deal with us. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I agree. I try to. I try to ask that question in a way I just feel, um, I don't think, it, you know, anything is, this is just, these are New Yorkers, you know, and every, every New Yorker should be treated equally. So I, I do have a question since, since you are two voluntary hospitals in terms of costs and billing, mm -hmm. do, you, do you find that TGNCNB individuals are, are denied um, more often than not? I know you're working on 73 active denials. But you know there is that that conversation that is that is commonly had in New York City in terms of public versus private services, and I wonder, you yeah. know, whether you know in terms of TGNCNB mm -hmm. services, you know, how are you kind of addressing a, at least mm -hmm. what I feel is it could be misinformation, but how are you addressing that? I'm going to give you the honest answer to yes. that. The honest yeah. answer You're, is that yeah. we every time we have to bill uh, an insurance provider for services, we have to fight to get it. Um, and one of the problems is even though there's this, a mandate at the New York State level that if you're an insurer who does business in New York State, you have to cover transgender related care, um, there's no mandated criteria. So they're all using different criteria for people to have to demonstrate that they're eligible for the care or um, some of its outdated standards of care. Um, so um, what we do is we provide our patients, and I, I'm sure you, you all do the same, we, we have um, people that we hire just to do the financial negotiations with the insurance company on behalf of our patients. Um, sometimes it's easier than other times, but you never know. And so we find ourselves spending a lot of time trying to get people pre-approvals for all kinds of services that are related specifically to transition, not necessarily to standardized care, but specifically to transition-related care, which is hormones and, and surgery. And I would agree. I would say we, we also have a social worker that helps at least put out there what are the things you need to have in place because the trans people already have so many barriers and burdens on them. So let's try to take that off. But I would say it's also really frustrating because it keeps changing. So sometimes we'll know what you need for the insurance letter and then they'll change that. And I would say it's particularly difficult for youth. It's very difficult for us to get young people, and we have people as young as 13, 14 coming in for top surgery, and there's a lot of denials there. So we do a lot of advocacy work, but it's very difficult. Okay. Did you have a, if, oh, sorry. All right, well, <laughs> so, thank you very much to this panel and for your leadership in this area. And we'll call up our next panel, including Brianna Silverberg, who I know has to leave, so we'll give her up an opportunity to start us off. Cecilia Gentili also from GMHC. Um, oh, Freddie Milano from Community Healthcare Network. And Chelsea Goldinger from the LGBT Center. And Bri Brianna, if you, if you had to leave, don't hesitate to kick us off. Thank you. Um, so I mainly wrote about personal experiences dealing with navigating trans health in New York City, so uh, that will be what I'm addressing today. So good afternoon, Chair Levine, Chair Rivera, and all assembled. Appreciate you guys taking the time to put this hearing together. My name is Brianna Silberg. 
I work in the policy department at GMHC. I'm an intern. I'm a trans woman, proud native New Yorker. Uh, what I want to address today is my experience navigating trans healthcare in the city and some of the disappointments, potholes, and sort of divots I've dealt with from what are supposed to be among some of the most aware and accommodating providers and the ways that concerns me and the sort of general implications that that seems to imply. Um, I first became a patient of Apache's, um, which is where I still get healthcare um, in my primary care service, in October of 2016. And when I went there, I was very excited. I was eager and a little scared and battered. And I was honest with my primary care physician about some of the anxieties I had starting hormone replacement therapy. Um, would I lose interest in hobbies? How would I change? What kind of person would I be? And how would this treatment affect me? Instead of getting sort of just reassurances about these concerns I had and the, uh, an attempt to sort of develop a safe, welcoming space for me, um, my nurse practitioner kind of heard all she needed to for my initial concerns. I was started on the lowest dose of estrogen that you can really get for daily treatment, which is two milligrams of estradiol taken orally, um, and no spironolactone, which is a common antiandrogen given to trans women in transition. And the reason I bring this up is it's hard to convey how much I was sort of the dictionary definition of crustfallen the day that I came in three months later to see my blood work and that my blood levels had barely budged. My testosterone and estrogen levels in my bloodstream were essentially unchanged from if I ever started HRT. And it took literally years until I was getting to a point where I started to get on a decent dose of injectable estrogen, where I started to see reflective changes in my blood work uh, that I had been crying over and praying for for years, and the physical changes that started to confirm to me that I was actually becoming the person I always knew myself to be, and maybe more importantly, that the incredibly unwelcome advance of masculine traits in myself began to seize. The reason I bring all of this up is that trans people are often incredibly afraid of losing, quote unquote, really, any more of our lives and time than we already have. I really feel that we need to train providers to not tr uh, treat fairly routine anxiety about procedures and treatment as something to act like alarmists over. A lot of very real and preventable harm is getting done when we do this. Trans people are bombarded with scare media before transition, especially before we have these chances to live our authentic lives and to meet other trans people to help reassure us about every other thing that we need to do to become our true selves. So my ask to you is that we become taken, that we take far more seriously combating this phantom boogeyman of non-existent risk over trans regret and constant tiptoeing in case trans patients do things like change their mind that often comes from cis medical providers giving trans-centered care. Providers need to be educated about how to reassure their patients and the anxieties that we have to have a more comprehensive idea of where we are coming from when they administer treatment to us. We need to stop treating provider-wide unease about things like prescribing too many hormones too fast that helps no one and hurts scores of trans patients. I don't know about any trans patients who have stories of regrets about taking too much of a dose of HRT, but I do know many patients like myself who have gone through ridiculous lengths when dealing with apparently the most accepting and understanding providers before getting appropriate doses of needed medication. It is truly ridiculous and it does need to stop. Below I've provided my email address for you if you would like to reach out and continue this conversation on your time and I appreciate all of your time you've given to me. Thank you. Impeccably timed and thank you for sharing your perspective, Brianna, and it's, it's very painful to hear about the challenges you faced and it should inspire all of us to make the system do better for you. you and for uh, many, many other New Yorkers. Thank you for speaking out. Cecilia? Hi. Um, so, um, Chair Levine, Chair Rivera, thank you so much for um, having me here. Um, uh, my name is Cecilia Gentili, and I work as the Managing Director of Policy and Public Affairs at GMAC, Gay Men Health Crisis, and I'm a funding member of the Equity Coalition. Today, I am here representing both, but more interestingly, as a person of trans experience, a transgender woman that gets sick sometimes like anybody else. I have the privilege to have a great insurance and to be able to have a very sensitive medical provider who offers me health services crafted to my experience and understand my body and my realities in life. But I also get sick after 6 p.m and I also get sick on, the, sick, sick on the weekends. For years, I have experienced the most terrible treatment at city hospitals, from being misgendered to being told by providers that they didn't know if they could put me in a woman's room, as if I wasn't one, from being told by a doctor that they didn't want to check my private parts because they didn't want me to feel um, uncomfortable. 
to having to explain to nurses why I don't have a menstrual cycle. Very inconvenient scenarios to experience in life and even worse while being sick or unwell. <laughs> the great city of New York offers me the chance to make a complaint and that is reaffirming, but <clears throat> it is time to prevent these interactions, then experience them and then complain. We do need to make services at city hospital comprehensive of people like me. How? We could train medical providers and employees in general, uh, in, in employees in general at city hospital. We can create a TGNCMB healthcare liaison program across hospitals with transgender nonconforming and gender non-binary staff assisting other members of the community navigate health systems. And we can also create a transgender nonconforming and gender non-binary specific care review board composed by community members to oversee transgender nonconforming and non-binary healthcare in public and private healthcare systems. Thank you so much for taking the opportunity and giving me the time to talk um, here. It's my information, my email, my phone is there too. Thank you, Cecilia, and for your ongoing amazing leadership in this work. It's always wonderful to have your voice. And the great Freddie. Good afternoon. Thank you, uh, Chairman Levine and Chairman Rivera, and the members of the committee uh, for the opportunity to speak this afternoon. My name is Dr. Freddie Molano and I'm the Vice President for Infectious Diseases and LGBT Programs at Community Healthcare Network. CHN is a federal qualified uh, health center that has uh, 15 clinics, including three school-based uh, centers and a fleet of five mobile units. Um, for nearly 15 years, CHN has provided affirmative healthcare services to transgender and gender non-conforming individuals throughout New York City in, in a family setting um, environment. We serve approximately 500 transgender, gender non-conforming individuals uh, in our transgender family program and our sexual behavioral health clinics based in Queens, Lower East Side, Queens, and Manhattan. Our mission is grounded in the belief that all the individuals have the right to comprehensive and cultural responsive care. Part of the mission is our duty to ensure that the TGNC patients receive services in an, an envir environment that is both safe and affirming. This includes providing uh, care at CHN health centers and promoting changes across the larger healthcare system. However, many transgender uh, GNC individuals continue to face challenges uh, accessing gender affirming uh, care. Um, among the larger barriers to care are fears of stigmatization, medical claims, denials, and a lim limited clinical workforce in the field of trans health. We hear these challenges from the patients and, are and we're trying to work on ways to overcome them. In many ways, the path to TGNC friendly health care begins outside the medical health center. To build better partnerships between providers and patients, clinicians must come out to the table with a better understanding of the TGGNC health concerns. Medical schools should incorporate mandatory transgender health training in their curricula, and academic institutions should prioritize research and transgender health disparities and outcomes. These efforts should be implemented alongside with the development of better metrics for measuring quality outcomes among the transgender populations. These efforts should be uh, directed and inc included transgender individuals. Community Healthcare Network has already taken the lead in building a, clini a clinical workforce. And this fall, we hosted our eight conference, transgender on, uh, eight conference on transgender health that we brought together more than 500 individuals to provide um, expertise. And I guess this is me. <laughs> Thank you very much for having me, us in here. Thank you. Thank you, Freddie. Thank you. 
Hello, uh, my name is Chelsea Goldinger. I'm the Government Relations Manager at the Lesbian, Gay, Bisexual, and Transgender Community Center, commonly referred to as the Center. Um, I just wanted to highlight some of the TGNC support services we provide. I know that the Center's Gender Identity Project, which was our first TGN-specific effort, uh, launched in 1989, was referenced in the committee report. And since then, we have expanded to other support services, including educational and counseling, a specific career services support, and other economic stability initiatives aimed at empowering the TGNC community. Uh, and in addition, we actually, on the uh, insurance side, we are a designated navigator, navigator agency, so we do help all folks across the spectrum and identities uh, actually enroll in the New York State Health Insurance and on the exchange. Um, so thank you to both Council Members Rivera and Levine for, of course, convening this hearing. Um, we were, are continuing to be excited about the city's LGBTQ Health Bill of Rights, which, as we heard from uh, the administration earlier, was a great step. Um, the problem we have heard from many of our community members is they're unaware still of these rights, despite the fact that I know there have been tremendous efforts to try and disseminate that widely. Um, based on the feedback we have heard, and especially on related to people reporting grievances, uh, I think that's the top concern that we have heard in understanding their rights and that there was a method for doing that. We do recommend a revamped uh, outreach effort to ensure that this goes across the spectrum. For example, I think elderly care and family support care are often overlooked when discussing TGNC health, and I think that ensuring providers like that and everyone who works in the space um, at every level is um, well-versed and affirming and supportive. Uh, and the other area um, I wanted to talk about, I think, which we've heard from others, is uh, care that is not specific to TGNC people. So ensuring that this care goes beyond the spectrum. Um, folks often don't want to go to the doctor for checkups, for basic services, uh, press exams, because of the fear for not having affirming care. And I think just ensuring that we continue to talk about the spectrum of health needs for the community. Um, one of our biggest recommendations that we have is to complement the LGBTQ Bill of Rights to create an actual healthcare toolkit, uh, specific, specific LGBTQ healthcare tool toolkit uh, for healthcare providers that actually gives them guidance and templates for things like making affirming forms, verbal, verbal language to use that's affirming and supportive, body language that's supportive, and some of what we've heard from folks so that there's one consolidated resource um, for providers to go to as opposed to just kind of having a list of what those rights, but to actually enact those rights. Um, Regardless of any of these possible solutions, um, we also just wanted to emphasize that TGNC people are just New Yorkers. They're not one monolithic group, and we need to look at them across identities. I um, was glad to hear the question about ensuring services throughout the five boroughs, because that is something else we have heard. People come to the center um, from all five boroughs because of a lack of care within their own boroughs and neighborhoods, and so we'd love to see, of course, more resources outside of uh, our neighborhood as well. Thank you, and we'd be happy to partner on any of these recommendations. All right, thank you, Chelsea. All right, Council Chair Rivera. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much. Um, and and Freddie, I know uh, I didn't. I know you didn't get to finish your testimony, but I saw something here about um, your the Tweet program in Jamaica Queens and linking people to HIV services. Yeah. Actually, a Tweet program. Um, is a transgender women of color entering in, in, engaging in care. And it was just declared by HERSA as the evidence-based science uh, intervention. We were able to recruit 186 women living with HIV, all translatina, mostly undocumented. And they were, the goal was to keep them in care for five years. And prior to viral law becoming something that people talk about it, we were able to get a viral loss suppression over 80%. And for a study, that in the last five years, we were able to have a retention rate in 84% of those patients. Right now, this uh, New York-based evidence intervention is being replicated in Puerto Rico, in um, Detroit, Michigan, and in New Orleans. And, and the reason why I also mention it is because I mentioned earlier how the TGNC NV community is disproportionately homeless and unemployed and HIV and AIDS is, is definitely an issue. And I wondered how does that how does that conversation influence your work? How does it how has it changed how you're organizing and how you're speaking to people and, and when we talk about violence and we mentioned twenty two murders nationally, mm -hmm. but we know this is an ongoing issue and every trans remembrance week there are more names to remember and to honor. And I wonder how, how have these issues uh, influenced your work over the years? And, and, and that goes for anyone uh, on the panel. 
Well, I think the most important thing uh, when uh, we are working with the trans community, it is to ensure that we have, that we identify what I call the gatekeepers, the leaders. Uh, we try to go many times through academia or through more formalized education without thinking about that the better leaders in the community are the ones who learn on the streets, who, who came to teach us and bring them as, as staff members. I think that that's very important and also uh, there were two individuals before in here that I admire because that's what they preach and they do every day, which is Barbara and Nathan. And I think that when we uh, embrace the community and we work with them, they are able to guide us where the resources are. They know which um, housing unit has three uh, places that I can use tonight. They know which pantries I can uh, redirect our patients today. So don't be afraid of asking the community what resources they have because they are the best partner that we can have. I actually used to manage a program at Apicha um, that would complement medical services with case management. And that was a great model, right? Because it, you know, being medical services here, mental, servi mental health services and case management. So it would give you a pre-holistic you know, approach because it's not just about like, you know, take your medicines. How are you gonna take your medicines if you slept under a bridge, you know? It makes sense that you may not remember to take your medicines, right? Uh, and like, it's, it's not, uh, it's many, many other issues that, that have to be taken under consideration when it comes to healthcare. Unfortunately, it was just me and two people for 625 patients, you know? And most of those 625 patients had extreme issues. It's like when you say housing, it's not like easy to get somebody housing, right? When you say an immigration uh, 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 status, like most of these, um, the people that I had help, they had clear uh, immigration um, situations for what they could, um, you know, ask for an asylum or a T visa or a U visa. But it takes years to do that. And three people could not take care of all so, so many people. That's why I believe like the liaisons, having liaisons in hospitals, having like, you know, uh, um, patient navigators, having, you know, case managers that help patients with other services that would complement the, their health is very, very important. And of course, those patient navigators or case managers they have to represent the community. They should be trans, gender non-conforming, or gender non-binary too, because it is my experience that me, I, I don't open the same way to a case manager when it's cisgender than when it's transgender. I always like to see myself in the person giving me services. Thank you, thank you thank very much. Thank you. Great panel, thank you so much for all your work. Next, we're going to call up Andrea Bowen from the Bowen Public Affairs Consulting Group. Vanessa Crespo from the New York City Anti-Violence Project. Tanya Asapansa Johnson Walker from the New York Transgender Advocacy Group and Kiara St. James, also from the New York Transgender Advocacy Group. Welcome. Andrew, you want to start us off? Oh, I turned off the mic. Uh, good afternoon, Chair Levine and Chair Rivera, and thank you both for holding this hearing. Um, I'm Andrea Bowen. I'm principal of Bowen Public Affairs Consulting. I have the honor for, of consulting with New York City Anti-Violence Project and also working in coalition with several of the organizations that are offering testimony today. Um, also worth saying I am a trans woman and I've been really delighted by your questioning and your deep focus on like really in the, in, uh, in the weeds issues here. So, um, so thank you. Um, and I'm also going to be submitting um, for the record, if that's okay, uh, testimony of Jocelyn Castillo, um, 
uh, leader and activist with Make the Road New York who wasn't here to make it, and her testimony is in Spanish. So um, uh, I want to reflect a couple of just reflections from the community and then just go into some quick policy like recommendations um, that you've heard already today. <laughs> um, uh, TGNC and B and transgender non-conforming and non-binary community members have said repeatedly in public forums and otherwise um, that they face disrespect and lack of knowledge about TGNC and B health issues from health providers across New York City. Um, I mean, you've heard that, but it's just worth repeating over and over and over again until uh, it's just patterned on our brains. Um, a second wide, um, you know, that extends not just to a lack of proper treatment around TGNCMB specific healthcare, but also other issues like heart disease, diabetes, just general healthcare needs, and so on. Um, third, community members um, have spoken to the need for more widespread uh, TGNC. TGNCMB competent healthcare services across the city. I know there was a discussion about the list of, uh, I think, over 100 different places that people could go for healthcare, but in the um, same 2015 uh, Health and Human Services study that um, h, h cited in their report, um, one of the findings out of that was that 24.2% um, of TGNCMB people reported facing long distances to receive culturally competent health care, compared with 11.1% of people who didn't identify as TGNCMB. Um, so that's worth noting. Um, sure, it might be located all throughout the city, but that doesn't, that doesn't necessarily mean it's where you need it to be, right? Um, so finally, um, a coalition of organizations I've worked with, including ABP, Sylvia Rivera Law Project, GMHC, Make the Road New York, and the Trans Latinx Network, put forth policy recommendations a year ago um, that could address some disparities for the community. Um, so I'm just gonna outline some of those. One, funding um, for community members, especially TGNCMB people of color, to become a cadre of uh, paid trainers for medical systems. Um, you know, that solves two problems, right? Um, it not only helps build a system for training continuously, but also provides perhaps employment for folks who are doing that kind of work. Um, secondly, creating, uh, as uh, folks have noted, a TGNCMB healthcare liaison program across hospitals with TGNCMB people uh, as those liaisons um, to help people navigate the complexities of the healthcare system. Um, everything from ensuring culturally competent care to making sure insurance pays for treatments. And finally, creating um, TGNCMB specific care review boards composed of community members to oversee community health care and public and private health care systems. So review boards, liaisons, uh, cadre of tra trainers, all of those staffed with actual TGNCMB people specifically. Um, and I'm happy to detail these more at your request. Thank you so much for this hearing and uh, I yield my time. All three seconds of it. That was uh, very important and powerful remarks. Thank you. And you submitted that in writing as well, we believe. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Look forward to reviewing uh, your policy proposals. Yeah. Thank you. Please. Hi. So greetings um, to the committee, um, hospitals, and the committee on health. And both committee chairs, Carolina Rivera and Mark Levine, for hearing my testimony on TGNC folks' access to services. Uh, my name is Vanessa Victoria Crespo. I am a client advocacy specialist and counselor at the New York City Anti-Violence Project. Um, as you may know, ABP empowers LGBTQ and HIV-affected communities and allies to end all forms of violence uh, through organizing and education and support survivors through counseling and advocacy. And we envision a world in which all lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, HIV-affected people are safe and respected and live free from violence. I am here today because I'm, I'm having uh, access to proper and affordable health care is something very important to me as a trans woman, but it's also uh, paramount to the TGNC clients that we serve at ADP. Uh, thanks to the NYC's transgender rights law and CCHR's gender identity and gender expressions legal enforcement guidance, 
Um, providers have been required to improve their coverage for trans care, even though they still make trans folks jump through many hoops uh, and undergo headaches to get services they need. But still, many healthcare practitioners lack the competency and care and to give us the care that we need. In many instances, medical providers ask intruding questions and medical, and they are not pertinent to the pressing health issues that we may be experiencing. For example, um, I have had clients at ABP that share with me how they would go to a hospital or urgent care for a cold or a flu and had nurses or doctors ask, ask questions about their genitals or what surgeries they have had and even questions about how their family members feel about their transition. Uh, this is a systemic violence that we know is affecting TGNC people. For TGNC people, knowing that these questions are coming their way, it pushes them to delay uh, seeking the care that they need, often further escalating health issues that could have been addressed before. Um, it is important to note that competent care is not just necessary uh, for the practitioner, but should be required for all staff. Administrators, doctors, nurses, and, facilit and facilitate staff should undergo trans competency training. Many organizations, including AVP, already have existing trainings that could be used throughout the city, and it is important to have TGNC liaisons at every city hospital to help TGNC folks navigate the healthcare system. We've been pushing as a budgetary uh, strategy with the TGNC Solutions Coalition since last spring. Um, it is pivotal, pivotal for all healthcare providers to get the proper education and training so that trans people can get the safe and competent care that they need and don't need to turn to black market, um, if not only for trans healthcare being so expensive, but not to have to deal with shaming experiences uh, with medical providers. Uh, thank you to the Committee on Hospitals and Health uh, for taking your time to hear my testimony today. Thank you. Ms. Tanya? Greetings. I'm going to send, because I have a lot of typos on my papers, so I'm going to send this to you all later on. So um, my name is Kiara St. James. I'm a black woman of trans experience, and I know firsthand how discrimination has impacted my community, especially via the healthcare system. This is one of the reasons why I founded, I co-founded the nonprofit organization, New York Transgender Advocacy Group, which I am now executive director, along with my co-founder, Tanya Asapansa Walker. At NITAG, we focus on policies that will help best serve the transgender and gender nonconforming community. We also educate health providers on TGNC issues and how to best serve our community. This is because many members of TGNC community, of, in the um, TGNC community, including myself, have shared horrific experiences of being denied quality services. As recently as last week, a colleague of mine was intentionally misgendered at a very well-known hospital in the city. Another colleague, and she's, she's gonna go more in detail about that, um, also experienced discrimination. We must also remember housing is a healthcare issue, and too many TGNC community members are blatantly discriminated against, even if they have a city voucher that covers all their rent. Therefore, I am here today to request mandated ongoing transgender and gender nonconforming sensitivity trainings to all medical providers and their, their supporting staff as well as security, maintenance, and other businesses that can conduct any businesses with these medical facilities. Also, a monitoring system to be implemented to penalize landlords who continue to discriminate. Thank you. Thank you, you very time. much. Uh, <laughs> we still have time. Yes. Hi. 
I'm Tanya Azza Panza Johnson Walker. And the reason why I use that name, my, it was my grandfather's name. He was the first black fire chaplain in New York City. And they co-named the street after him on Staten Island. Um, I'm a 55 years old. I am the co-founder of New York's Transgender Advocacy Group. And uh, I'm the policy liaison there. Um, in 2017, I have it written here, I uh, came down with lung cancer again for the second time in March of that year. And uh, while I was at the hospital, I was misgendered constantly by the staff, even the social worker. And uh, I was left in uh, diarrhea, and uh, I was also, I had to clean my room by myself. Um, the staff was very disrespectful. I was harassed. I was a, a mistreated. I was treated like a dog. I'm, I'm an Army veteran, honorably discharged. And uh, the staff there at Memorial Sloan Kettering, uh, they didn't have an LGBT uh, program for us to go to, you know, or somebody to help us that was LGBT at the hospital, although they say they're LGBT affirming. See what it is, they get lost, everyone gets lost in the, L in the alphabet, the LGBTQ, blah, blah. No, I'm transgender, and transgender people are always eliminated from that alphabet. And uh, while I was at the hospital, I mean, I had catheters shoved into me, into my urethra, and I bled. I've, uh, I had to clean my own room with one arm, dragging a tank, an oxygen tank, and a, one of those urinal things that you urinate in. It was a big plastic can. And I also had a pump on a pole that I had to drag around cleaning my room. Uh, I was refused my medications. And uh, when nurses were talking about me in room, they were misgendering me as well. The uh, social worker, I have their names and everything, uh, told me, uh, she doesn't have to call me by my gender pronouns. She said she calls me as what she sees me as. I mean, the training must be done by transgender women. We're discriminated against the most. Um, we're all constantly misgendered by staff at the hospitals, even today. You know, I've been refused uh, dental treatment at Harlem Hospital, you know, and misgendered. I mean, breach of confidentiality, constantly, I mean, they feel like they have the right to discriminate against us. And when I tried to get help from a lawyer or the Human Rights Commission, they told me that they could not help me. They couldn't promise they could help me. So that's why there's not that many lawsuits going around against these hospitals, because we're being refused help. Thank you. Well, thank you, Ms. Azapansa Johnson Walker. Thank you for your service uh, to you. the nation. Um, horrifying to hear what you have been subjected to. That incident you described at, at MSK, was that recently? Or what that was in 2017. That was my second time with lung cancer. Okay, and has the hospital given you any kind of response? You filed a No, they, I had a letter sent. I had it written by Sylvia Rivera Law Project. They haven't written me back. And I called Dr. Downey's office the other day, and they told me that my account was blocked. So they, they, they're refusing to treat me now because I had a, let, a letter written. Okay, well, maybe uh, the chair and I will follow up directly with the hospital. Um, and you mentioned you were denied dental care. Was that at Harlem Hospital? That was at Harlem Hospital. I was denied dental care. On the grounds that they claim they're not equipped to deal with transgender people? On, on different health issues. They, they were, like, asking me for information I didn't have, you know, to, and refusing to do it. This was before I went to Israel in June. Okay, um, if it would be helpful, I know that we would be happy to follow up on that matter as well. Uh, are you currently, we could talk at another time, but if you're not currently getting adequate care and anyone in the council can help with that, uh, we would of course be very happy to fight for you in any way. Thank you, okay. thank you. Mm -hmm. but, yes, clearly you're someone who's empowered and you know you can go to places, so I can just imagine all the stories that aren't told. So I just want to thank you for 
sharing your experience, which is actually a big deal. And anyone in this room or anyone that you know, if they experience something like that in a place that is supposed to welcome every single person that walks through that door, please let us know. Yes, and and Ms. St. James, are you- Thank you for your service. Oh, That's thank fine. you. Thank you. M Ms. St. James, well, we, you, you mentioned that the organization is uh, doing some training of medical professionals. Uh, is, is it appropriate for you to tell us where are you doing that training, what kind of hospitals or settings? Yes, so we do trainings um, currently relocated in Harlem, 125th, 215th, um, second floor. Um, so West 125th Street, thank you. So we do trainings where we actually just had three, actually we had a series of six hour trainings where we um, had people, um, RSVP, so um, they come into our, our setting. So we share space also within Blocka. Right, so we have a space on the third floor where we can do all day <clears throat> trainings. So in those trainings, we talk about the micro, meso, and macro levels of advocacy. Um, also, because I was MEPA, or we was MEPA before MEPA was cool. So that's a people, meaningful involvement, people living with, with AIDS. Um, as someone who has been HIV empowered for over 20 years, we lead with that lens um, in the, the work we do. And so it's been, um, a good turnout, you know, talking about issues that have impacted um, the trans community. We also had an amazing turnout for the first ever trans sponsor by New York Transgender Advocacy Group Policy Day in Albany, where we address our legislative platform, which um, consists of gender, um, conversion therapy, was the other, comprehensive health care, um, starting in the elementary school as well as gay, gay and trans panic, thank you. And so we do a lot, we encompass a lot of that work and how we are really making sure that we are not just meeting with medical providers, but we're also educating our community members. We're very boots on ground. And so um, we take that very passionately. Well, thank you. What an incredible panel from start to finish. Thank you all for speaking out today. And our final panel is Noah Lewis from Trans Transgender Legal, Sasha Alexander from the Sylvia Rivera Law Project, and Carrie Davis. Noah, would you like to kick us off? Sure, I'm Noah Lewis, the interim senior staff attorney at Transgender Legal Defense Education Fund. I'm also the executive director of Transcend Legal, which is an organization that focuses on challenging insurance denials and exclusions for transgender people. So I wanted to share with you some stories of provider discrimination as well as insurance discrimination from people in New York City. So in July, somebody contacted us, uh, at the sister of a transgender man who suffers from anxiety and depression, and he had worked up the courage to go to a gynecologist so that he could have a hysterectomy. And he did not want to travel, he could not, was not able to travel far to Manhattan to come to a provider who specializes in transgender care. So he called around to a lot of local providers in Brooklyn. Most of them just simply didn't return his phone call, but one of them did, so he went and he had an appointment. And the hysterectomy was to be scheduled, but the woman who was going to schedule it simply laughed at him. And the doctor did not address this issue and he was supposed to have another procedure done and he canceled that. He hasn't gone back to the doctor and now he's afraid to go to any doctor, um, which is just emblematic of the kind of discrimination that transgender people face. Similarly, uh, a transgender man went to Mount Sinai to have a hysterectomy where they do have someone who is, does specialize in hysterectomies for transgender men, but the staff has not all been trained as Barbara Warren indicated and so he was being misgendered and at a time he was also experiencing complications from the hysterectomy and it was a very distressing time for him to be misgendered um, in the hospital like that. Um, another issue which has come up is that midwives in New York State are only licensed to treat women under the law and so a transgender woman went to a private clinic and when she was asked when her last menstrual cycle was and she explained that she didn't have one because she was transgender, the person said, oh, I'm not licensed to treat men and went out and checked with her supervisor and came back and, you know, without doing any kind of 
questioning about her surgical status or anything like that. You know, it was just like, I can't treat you because you're a male. So she had, was misgendered in a way such that she couldn't even access care from this person. Um, and on the insurance front, um, there are barriers that come from the insurance company. So even City of New York employees, they, if they have the GHI plan, which is administered by Emblem Health, their policy, their clinical policy on gender affirming care categorically um, states that certain treatments such as facial feminization or voice therapies are considered cosmetic and they place an extra burden on transgender people to overcome that to get covered. So what we think is helpful is funding for training at these hospitals. I was one of the people that is uh, doing the training at HH uh, hospitals for the adolescent uh, providers. And it is very effective to be able to get in there and, and train the people. Another thing that's very effective is medical legal partnerships. When people are getting insurance denials, they are generally effective uh, if the person has legal representation. If, if they have access to counsel, they can get those insurance denials overturned, but it is a question of resources right now. People don't have enough access to attorneys. And finally, enforcement by the New York City Human Rights Commission um, so, that, so that people don't have to hire an attorney because you know the person in Brooklyn getting misgendered, a private attorney is not going to be able to take that case. There's not enough money there. But it would be very effective for something like the City Human Rights Commission to come in and, and take an interest. But they, um, even getting an intake appointment can take months there. It's just w wildly under-resourced. Thank you. Thank you very much. No, very, very helpful. And Sasha? Hi, y'all. Good afternoon. Um, I appreciate you holding this hearing, because often as organizers, we feel like we're the ones beating down the door to get you all in the room with us. So it's nice to be invited to the room to be here with you all. Um, I'm Sasha Alexander. I'm the director of membership at the Sylvia Rivera Law Project. We've fought for health care and numerous other issues for TGNC folks for over 16 years. And um, about two weeks ago, leading up to this hearing, we held a listening session to talk to some of our members about the issues. Uh, and before I go into those, I want to thank you for highlighting the intersection with Trans Day of Remembrance and also highlight that those numbers don't include trans people who were harmed by the medical industrial complex or suicide. And so there's so much intersection in people being able to access health care and that actually leading to um, a number of deaths in our community. So I appreciate y'all making those important connections. So in the listening sessions we held, people talked about providers, insurance companies, pharmacies, and hospitals, access to hormones, specifically testosterone and estrogen, detours and potholes on the way to receiving care, such as healthcare professionals not providing affirming care. Many agreed that you have to fight to get access and shared that you had to deal with denials of care alone or felt that your provider wasn't listening when you expressed how much anxiety that created. One woman was even told she wasn't ready um, and was told what she needed for her body and um, she had expressed what she needed for years. A lot of folks shared their experience with doctors and nurses not wanting to touch them and everyone agreed ERs and psych units needed better training to work with TGNC people. So I'm here to share uh, a little more about some of those areas. Uh, both on behalf of the themes that we've seen in our membership and as a trans person myself who's accessed care for over 15 years. So one of the issues that I named was access to surgery and hormones, and I think it's already been named. There's a huge issue with denials that folks are going through, um, but while that's happening, that can send someone spiraling into crisis, not only having to uh, repeatedly get denied and what that can bring up for them, um, but also then having to wait and wait and not necessarily be able to access that care. And so we've also talked to a lot of community members who were isolated after they access care and did not have the quality of the results that they wanted, whether they felt those results were botched or those results needed multiple, multiple revisions. Um, there was a lot of isolation, particularly for trans women who experienced this. Um, and our members are folks who are low income, they're people living with HIV, they're immigrants, they're folks with disabilities, and there are a lot of folks who don't necessarily feel they can go to or have felt it's been effective to go to the Commission on Human Rights. Ourselves, we are a legal service provider, and uh, Noah illuminated this, a lot of these are cases that our folks cannot, cannot take. 
Um, there's also the issue of actually after people have surgery and they go to a public hospital. We had one member, this was about two years ago, who <laughs> bled out in Harlem Hospital. Um, she's alive, but she had a terrible uh, experience with care there. Uh, I just want to highlight a couple other pieces. Mental health support has been a huge issue for our folks. So obviously folks have to access mental health support to gain access to surgery, but there's not enough um, consistent resources for folks, whether there's a certain number of mental health um, sessions they can have or not having people of color or trans folks who can provide that care for them. Um, the other issue was staffing, which I feel like folks have talked about, but one issue specifically was feeling that there are not enough surgeons to provide the um, procedures that folks want, and now that there are, there are long wait lists or concerns about, for example, the surgeon at HHC, for example, who's only done 20 surgeries uh, in the years they provided surgery versus the other more popular places our community goes. Um, there's a definitely need for advocacy support when you're in these facilities and you shouldn't need it as folks named. We're part of this TGNC Solutions Coalition uh, and we know how important it is for folks to have navigators and advocates in those spaces like Sarah Benders all over the place even though she's very effective. People don't know she exists or don't know about that resource and we've worked with her directly and heard that they don't have the funding to let people know about their services. Um, which is a huge issue. And the last one that I just want to name, which is a really important issue to us, and people have named homeless communities, is that if you are in a DHS shelter, you cannot access surgery. And so we have TGNC folks who have been in a shelter system three, going on three years, and they've had to wait to access their care because they cannot access it. We've sat down with DHS to talk about this issue. They've told us they're not a medical care provider. They don't have to meet those needs. Um, we even had a member who needed a knee surgery. She had to wait two years to have that till she could get housed. So there's a real important issue because so many of our folks are pushed out of homes and into the shelter system. And then many of our folks don't feel safe to stay in the shelter system that they're just not able to access surgery as a result. And that's, like I said before, sending a lot of folks spiraling uh, in terms of that. So I would just push for what a lot of folks have already asked for um, in terms of more TGNC specific advocates and supports. The other one, connecting to the shelter system is TGNC specific hallways or spaces where folks can receive their care. Um, and the other one which someone named is substance abuse centers that are specific to TGNC folks. Thank you. Thank you, Sasha. Carrie? Good afternoon, and thank you for this opportunity to talk about the health needs of transgender and gender non-binary people. My name is Carrie Davis. I'm a healthcare consultant and trainer, and I serve as a New York State Commissioner of Human Rights, so I want to hear more about some of the incidents. And I worked at the LGBT Community Center for, third, for 18 years. It's well documented that trans people are more likely to experience significant health disparities compared to their counterparts. Of all these concerns, the disparity concerning HIV always attracts the most attention, and for good reason. Trans women, in particular trans women of color, are the highest HIV risk group in New York City and the world. And HIV has become a seductive but selective framework for trans health. Trans people are described as high risk and our health care is reduced to HIV, hormones, and surgery, usually in that order. But trans people know this is not a substitute for genuine health care. Most importantly, HIV is often not a high on the list of needs prioritized by our community. When asked about health care, trans New Yorkers speak of unemployment, homelessness, immigration, access to denials of and lack of health care choice, violence, criminalization, and incarceration. We speak of being desperately poor and almost twice as likely to be very low income. Latin American trans activist Marcella Romero noted, I'm not a high risk person, I'm a member of a community that's put at high risk. We must address the forces that place trans people at health risk to improve the health outcomes of trans New Yorkers. The social determinants of trans health should be our focus. That sounds daunting, but we can do this. The majority of resources required to comprehensively address the health concerns of trans New Yorkers already exist, but are often, for a variety of reasons, inaccessible to us. Trans health is not only a matter of HIV, hormones, and surgery. It's not a matter for hospitals, community health centers, or the Department of Health. It's a matter of policing, corrections, education, employment, housing, immigration, youth, and more. We should be hearing from DOE, NYPD, HRA, DHS, ACS, DOC, and others at this hearing today. We should be building a comprehensive and holistic network of strategic, private, and public partners who work together to leverage New York's strengths in order to improve socioeconomic and health outcomes. 
we should build an approach that recognizes that trans people are served by a wide base of service providers that, rather than a single organization. We should build an approach that recognizes that trans New Yorkers live in all five boroughs, in all communities, and cannot be served by a few centers of excellence. We should recognize, we should um, promote a transgender health network. This could consist of three basic components, a network of linked resources and, provide, and qualified providers, a roadmap with guides and navigators to ensure trans people can access the network, and public leadership to bring these partners together and measure outcomes. A lot has happened in the over 20 years since I began working in the field of trans health. There have been some, some successes, but we still struggle in ways we'd hope we would become part of our history by now. Something has to change if trans New Yorkers are to take their rightful place as whole, healthy, successful, and self-sufficient leaders. We can start by retooling our work towards the outcomes that trans people themselves prioritize, rather than those decided by, for them by others with different agendas. If trans people, in particular trans people of color, are identified and engaged in a network of trans-led and relevant support services that directly improves our economic, education, social, and health status, we will be healthier and more likely to make a successful transition to self-sufficiency. We will become change agents and contributors to our healthy and thriving New York community. Addressing these concerns for transgender people is sustainable and cost-effective and will reduce the negative health consequences such as HIV, suicide, homelessness, incarceration, as well as their associated costs. Thank you. Um, my goodness, uh, I don't know if you agree, uh, Madam Co-Chair, but the testimony in this hearing from start to finish has just been incredible and so on point and powerful, and including this panel here. Um, it's great that this is all going to be now archived. The video will be available probably in the next day or so for the public to review, and all your testimony is going to be transcribed as well in addition to what's entered into the record. So we need to make sure that the broader world hears some of the very powerful testimony all of you offered. Um, I just want to ask one question about this topic that's come up again and again and again with the Human Rights Commission, which is the question of whether when a report is made of someone discriminating in the healthcare context against uh, a trans New Yorker or gender nonconforming, non-binary New Yorker, is there any sanction or enforcement or any punishment meted out uh, in response to what are clear violations of the law? Or in your experience, does the complaint just sort of die after it's, it's registered? I was just going to say all the people that we've worked with who we've seen uh, complaints investigated, none of them, at least that I can think of right now, are actually specific to the healthcare setting. And I don't know if you... One issue is that this is, can't be addressed in the moment. So if somebody's in the hospital, if they're in the hospital because they're suicidal and they're being misgendered, that's a situation that needs to be remedied right then. And so the commission can't necessarily do that. Yeah, I, I would say that if you have to go to the Commission Human Rights to get your needs met, our system has failed. Um, I, have, I have been thrown out of businesses in New York City as a transgender person when I tried to change on clothes. Now, this was years ago, but I didn't go to the Commission on Human Rights to press a complaint because that's a really horrific experience. It's humiliating, it's degrading, and to go through the process of seeking assistance, whether it's with a private attorney or an advocacy organization like SRLP or the Commission on Human Rights, requires someone to have a tremendous power and courage and be willing to be re-traumatized. The commission, I think, does its best. It had its budget cut this year. I mean, we're talking about, about like, why, is this, why is this commission of human rights not as effective as it could be. I think we need to look at, at the city and how it treats the commission of human rights. But I do think that there's a lot of, the commission is made mostly of lawyers who investigate cases and try to make a successful outcome from those cases when they can do so. I think their, their heart's in the right place. Sorry to interrupt, Carrie. You said that the commission had its budget cut because we just increased the, the staffing it, it there last year. It had its administrative budget cut. It a, had, a what? It had its administrative budget cut. So you're basically saying he, we're increasing part of your budget, but the part that makes you able to function, which is imagine how you could work without your aides and assistance here at the, at the council. So, so the overall budget has been increased, but the administrative piece was reduced. Yes, yeah, so it was cut was significantly. Right? So we, I think we, what we see is that we have to really look at ourselves as, as a city and how we, uh, what, what really real outcomes. We want the commissioning rights to be effective. We're going to have to invest in it. 
So um, we talked a lot today of um, individuals who are TGNCNB with intersecting identities. And so I wanted to ask what can we do to better assist specifically the disabled community? New Yorkers that are differently abled, specifically uh, New Yorkers with disabilities, just based on your experience. Um, well, specifically like the sh in the shelter system like we talked about. Yeah, the, the, and I agree that it, this has to be a, a holistic yeah. approach. And, and we didn't talk a lot about the shelter system, though I really w would like to. I just know that H&H &H will say, okay, you know, and I had this conversation with Commissioner Banks about, um, we talk about homelessness and when I bring up supportive housing, they're like, oh, we don't do supportive housing. So I just wonder, but you provide wraparound services, you know? So there is a, a disconnect and it has to do with bureaucracy and inefficiency and we have a long way to go as a city. I just wonder in some of the, maybe this testimony that you've heard from some of, the, from some of their experiences, you know, the, the, dis the disability community and how they access healthcare is extremely troubling. And so I just, you know, I know you've made a number of recommendations, but if you have some specifically for New Yorkers with disabilities, we are, we are very welcome to seeing how we can implement that at the very least and how you access healthcare. So just something to think about. I mean, I know one, one part of that is people physically being able to access it, and there have been concerns around Accessoride and different pieces like that. I know there are some TGNC people who have had issues with Accessoride, whether that's being misgendered or mispronounced, so the same things we see in, in every system. I think a lot of the things that happen to TGNC folks who are disabled are not unique to being TGNC, like a lot of the intersections that we have. Um, but I think I think overall, in terms of being able to um, access care, like folks named like specialty services, or um, like if you're being referred to services, there are a lot of issues. So I, I know we've heard from folks who are disabled, like when they're going to their specific provider, that's obviously not a Cal and Lord or an Aperture or something like that, that they might be then experiencing, um, like if they're non-binary, being misgendered or being misnamed, even if they've had their name change. Thank you. So could, I, could I just raise, it related to that, a lot of discussion today has been about training. And I think we need to see medical facilities incorporate the needs for transgender people or disabled people or disabled transgender people or as part of their DNA. It shouldn't be coming from an outside advocacy group. Um, I used to train uh, with the NYP for the NYPD, and as an outsider, I'm not seen in a favorable light. The NYPD is much more productive when it, bring, when it has transgender cops doing those trainings. And I think that the hospital system should be having transgender staff um, helping them moderate a training process. Whether that, I don't, I'm not suggesting you bring in, you have your own staff, doctors training, uh, doing basic uh, diversity or, or sensitivity trainings, but I am saying that internally these organizations bring in outsiders and the staff always see this as an outside issue. It has to become, as I said, kind of part of their DNA. And so um, everyone likes to be trained by the profession that they belong to. Doctors like to be trained by doctors, social workers by social workers, and so forth. These systems have to bring this internally in a way that they can see this as their issue and not some other force pushing back at them. Actually, one more thing um, that I just thought of in terms of um, disabled folks, in terms of being able to access hormones or surgery, there is something in the, in the WPATH standards that a lot of people use um, to determine care about pre-existing mental health conditions uh, sometimes being used as a reason to not allow somebody to have access to care. So for example, like we've had, we had a member who was schizophrenic, he's a trans man, he was undocumented and he tried for three years to get hormones and his provider wouldn't prescribe him hormones because the provider felt that he, because of his diagnosis, wasn't actually trans he just wasn't sure about his gender certain days. And so I think there's definitely an intersection there that there needs to be more, not just training, <laughs> ideally I think by disabled TGNC folks who I think really have been left out of some of the discussion about that, but to be able to bring that to folks. Thank you, thank you for your contributions and, and I wanna thank everyone for their patience as well today and the length of the hearing, so thank you, thank you. Thank you. 
Okay, this concludes our hearing. Thank you all very much.